Good morning. Would members of the Public Works and Infrastructure Committee please report to Committee Room 1 for quorum? Good morning. Would members of the Public Works and Infrastructure Committee please report to Committee Room 1 for quorum?
Okay, well, how long do we have? A minute? The mayor's coming, but... Thank you. Okay, we're going to start our meeting. We have a special guest today, the mayor. He has nothing else to do uh, but create quorum for public works and infrastructure, two meetings in a row. So thank you to the mayor. We, I'd like to call the meeting officially to order. This is Public Works and Infrastructure Committee, and I want to welcome the committee members and, of course, our mayor. And we have 14 items on today's agenda, so lots of, uh, lots of things to talk about and debate. Uh, just I'll remind people that we've got um, the screens at the back and the, at the side and uh, online you can watch it at www.toronto.ca backslash council. Are there any declarations of interest? Seeing none, uh, I'll move on to confirmation of the meetings. Could someone please move to confirm the meetings of our, the minutes of our last meeting? Councillor Holliday, uh, all in favour, that carries. Okay, we'll run through the agenda now, and we'll start with, we have speakers on a number of these issues, so, um, and some that have just registered. So, PW 25.1 amendment to purchase order number 6035802 uh, for reconstruction of TTC track allowance road, sidewalk structures, and water main replacement on Spadina Avenue from Lakeshore Boulevard to King Street. That is going to be held in my name for speakers. PW 25.2, amendment uh, to purchase order 6039080 for engineering services for construction contract administration for the odor control and process upgrades at the Humber Wastewater Treatment Plan. There's no speakers on that item. So if someone would like to move it, Councillor Greb is moving it. All in favour? Carried. PW 25.3, um, I'm going to hold this item and I think we also have a speaker on that, so that will congestion management plan. PW 25.4, contract award for tender call 265-2017, uh, rehabilitation of Rose Hill Reservoir and amendment to purchase order number uh, 6045909, professional engineering services during construction. I don't think we have any speakers on that, so Councillor Holliday is moving that. All in favour, that carries. PW 25.5, Metrolink's Eglinton Crosstown LRT extension of delegated authority for temporary Allen Road closures. There's no speakers on this item, so we could, the committee could move it at this time. If Councillor Greb, C Councillor Carmichael Greb has moved that. All in favour, carried. PW 25.6, parking time limit, Wyona Drive. Now, my understanding from the clerks is this is not actually properly before us, and this actually should uh, be moved to City Council. So we have a motion that I'm moving on behalf of uh, City Clerks that the recommendation 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 be amended by replacing Public Works and Infrastructure Committee with City Council. We don't have delegated authority. Yeah, so we don't have delegated authority. So all in favour? That carries. All right. Now, next item would be the uh, PW 25.7 cost sharing agreement for Steeles Avenue East with regional municipality with the regional municipality of York. Again, there are no speakers on that item. So, Councillor Holiday has agreed to move that. All in favour? That carries. PW 25.8, consent to assignment of municipal access agreements with 2B Fibre Incorporated. Again, no speakers on that. 
So Councillor Carmichael Greb has uh, offered to move that. All in favour? That carries. PW uh, 25.9, next steps for developing a third green bin organics processing facility. We do have a speaker on that. So we will hold that in my name as the chair, PW 25.10, Vision Zero Road Safety Plan. And we have speakers on that, so I'll hold that also in my name. PW 25.11, BIA Consultation on Green Street's Technical Guidelines. There's no, there's no, you want to, count? okay, Councillor Holliday will hold that item. So we'll carry on. PW 25.11. 12, curbside management strategy, improving how curbside space is used. There's a presentation on this as well as speakers, so I will hold that in my name. And two more to go. PW uh, 25.13, motion to reduce the number of Dorings in Toronto. We have a number of speakers on that. And then PW 25.14, multi-use trail, uh, Centennial College Progress campus and military trail road. I would recommend that we just refer that to budget committee at this time. Are, is the committee okay with that? All right, then if we, I will move that to refer to budget committee. And there is the motion. All in favor? Is Councillor Ainsley's even voting? He's very enthusiastic about that one. Um, uh, and that is carried. So, there we have it. So now we still don't have quorum. Well, we have quorum, but the poor mayor has to sit here. So let's get started with our first item. Um, and we do have a number of speakers with us today. So the first item is PW 25.1, amendment to purchase order for reconstruction of TTC track, road, sidewalk, structures, and water main replacement on Spadina Avenue from Lakeshore Boulevard. We have one speaker on this item, uh, and that is Hamish Wilson. Hamish, if you could come forward. Yes, good morning, and uh, special thanks to you, Mayor Tory, for filling in uh, yeah, late night and an early morning, and thank you. Um, my the decades scud. It seems that not too long ago, some of us were trying to find room on Spadina Avenue for bike lanes. Uh, over a few years, I'm not sure how many years, and epic fail, there wasn't enough room. How? How did that happen? Well, I guess we were too late in, uh, that's what we were told, we were too late in asking for the space for bike lanes, even though it's one of the widest streets in the downtown core. This is back in the uh, early 90s. Uh, and, um, you know, too late, sorry, not enough room, too bad, better luck next time. And so given the way that the curbs dictate the lane position, uh, that would take a long time because you don't usually go and reconstruct a road that you've just reconstructed. Well, here we are now, we're actually reconstructing the uh, the road. Uh, and in the meanwhile, we had the SOP uh, post amalgamation of having Spadina in the 2001 bike plan. It made it in uh, to have uh, bike lanes, where was it? Uh, proposed bike lanes on, Sp whoops, I'll get it aligned, pardon me. Uh, proposed bike lanes on Spadina. Uh, and uh, the bike plan got, uh, this one sort of got put aside. Uh, because it uh, didn't really reflect what you wanted to do, which wasn't all that much sometimes. Pardon me. Uh, so we got the Sharrows on Spadina after the edge line, and there's, I guess, kind of better. Uh, Thank you. I'm I was okay. making a point. Okay. <laughs> yep. Uh, so now some of Spadina is being reconstructed, and because it takes so very long to get scant done here in Toronto, Moronto, and it's not possible to keep up with all the problems and changes occurring, as the massive things and the small things seem to absorb years, uh, it seems that now there's a contract in place and a construction process. So it's pretty clear that there's been no change for cycling safety here. Uh, and it sure feels like contempt, but that's kind of standard, uh, despite the m many nice words. Perhaps more importantly, it's true contempt, I think, for the Places to Grow Act, sections 3.2 and 3.2.2 and 3.2.3, which theoretically, with routine changes and maintenance, or road rebuilding as this case, means that we move towards systemic change to protect the vulnerable road modes, i.e. we make it safer for pedestrians and cyclists when you do this sort of uh, 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 not so routine maintenance. But even the routine maintenance and repaving should have changes to uh, bike safety and to pedestrian improvements. 
Uh, so that means, in my view, we should be moving the, cur the curbs back as much as we can. Now, the street lights uh, dicta where the street poles are dictate the, the how far back we can go. But as you get towards, uh, get above this intersection, I think we really need to push the curbs back by another foot because that, that's what leads to the deaths. Um, Bicyclist killed after tangle with tanker truck. He was smeared further up on King Street. James McMillan. Another woman uh, recently, uh, how many years ago? Carolyn, I, I think that was her first name. She was killed as a truck passed her south of Dundas going northbound. These are people that were young. They deserve to live. The design of the road that when we failed to actually do the proper thing by providing safety for bikes helped kill these people. We need to have safety improvements here and for pedestrians as well. So widen it as much as you can, please, even though it's underway. And with um, pedestrian improvements, it's high time that we had raised crosswalks so that instead of having the pedestrians go down to the car level, the cars actually have to have a gradual speed bump. So especially at these Gardner uh, uh, Lakeshore positions, we need to have raised crosswalks up here, something there, something there, and something there. That's, this is now the time to do it, isn't it? I know it's midstream, but heck, when it takes 10 years or 12 years, pardon me, to get a little bit of paint on Bloor Street, uh, a third of what was promised to be done 10 years ago, um, it, it, it grates. And though the, here's a headline, uh, Spadina, Spadina latest example of cyclist safety ignored, and there was talk about willful blindness, and I think that is kind of what we've got here. Uh, so. What else uh, to rant about? Uh, I think it would be uh, pretty easy to do, relatively speaking. I know it's in mid-contract, but it's way easier to change a contract and change things uh, when uh, you're still in the process of actually doing things ahead of actually pouring the concrete. And the only real change that I've seen and observance of the Places to Grow Act in the old core uh, is uh, with Danforth when it was uh, repaved, uh, and that was. And there's another thing, an old blast from the past. So we really put ourselves into it. But the only real change that I saw with places to grow was on the Danforth from uh, Pape to uh, uh, to uh, Dawnlands. Otherwise, uh, it's pretty pathetic. Okay, thank you. Any questions of the uh, speaker? Seeing none. Any questions for staff? Seeing none, we're going to move to uh, any remarks or comments. Seeing none, we are going to ask someone to move the motion. Anybody would like to move this item? I could happily move it. Okay, everybody's moving it now. Councillor Holliday is moving PW 25.1. And uh, all in favour, that carries. Okay, our next item is congestion management plan. So that's PW 25.3, uh, semi-annual update, and we have one speaker on this item. Hamish, if you could come back to the mic. Oh dear, more congestion and more cost, and oh, of course we're dealing with it. Look, a list of projects. And pardon me, uh, you know, yes, there are some good things happening. Uh, I'm not sure that you're really grasping the actual issue because the real problem is uh, uh, that the congestion is caused by cars. I know it may be a bit of a surprise <laughs> to have this blast from the past, uh, but uh, here's a little lesson from Mr. Gardner. Uh, most difficult problem facing Canadian cities today is traffic congestion, said F.G. Gardner QC, Metro Chairman. Uh, quote, there is no mystery about what has caused the problem. There are 500, no, let's see, five, he says, no, what is it, five million, vehicle, uh, five million motor vehicles in Canada, half million of which are domiciled in metropolitan Toronto. We're now up to at least a million. Uh, but yeah, it's the cars that are making the problem. And I'm not sure that you're really addressing it. Uh, you got to actually like focus on what it takes to uh, trim the cars, which means better, better transit in the right places, not out in Scarborough. Uh, so I really think that's what we need to do is focus. And here's a little, ex a wonderful example of why cars congested from spacing mag, uh, a, a good color graphic as opposed to the mere photocopy. What uh, spring 2008? It shows the volume of space. Uh, by mode and when the mode is moving as well. So you can clearly see that the lion's share of the public road space 
tends to be uh, taken up by the, uh, the, 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 the cars or mobile furnaces as I sometimes call them, and not so much by these greener modes. Uh, interestingly, as I was scanning through some of my old files, I came across stuff that talked about these modes, the green modes, and uh, the cars and the, the motor vehicles as red modes. Uh, which is, is interesting. So in terms of what we need to be doing to really solve our congestion problems, we need to do effective transit in the right areas, and that is not in necessarily in uh, Scarborough. In fact, uh, we really need, if we want to solve the problem in, uh, in the centre of the city, uh, I think we need to be talking about uh, sensible transit in the core. That's one example, of course. There's the Queen Street ex uh, subway example from... Uh, uh, 1949 that was approved by uh, voters. Uh, that's what we need to be doing is doing effective transit in the right places, now, not out in Scarborough, where in fact I hope that you saw that the, uh, uh, the Guardian gave uh, uh, the Scarborough subway extension a, a real uh, uh, head top of the list in terms of white elephants uh, just a week ago. I don't wonder if that's here to show you. I hope so. Um, not necessarily. Uh, now, and in terms of the congestion that we're talking about, are we talking about traffic congestion, uh, or transit congestion as well? Uh, we have a horrendous problem on our King Queens uh, transit as well as the Bloor Young intersection. Uh, and I think we're not doing the obvious thing uh, for relieving congestion at Bloor Young in a, in a small way, but in a quick way as well. In London, with the uh, Transportation for London, uh, they figured out that if they put in a bikeway uh, parallel to a uh, subway, they actually got a reduction as much as 10% at really minimal cost. So that gets back to a favorite topic of mine still, because we haven't gone far enough or long enough in terms of the Blue or Danforth bikeway. Uh, if you really want to solve the transit congestion thing, you've got to make uh, the division zero and these congestion relief things actually reflect the transit demand as well. So there's a little bit of Bloor Street East that was in that 2001 bike plan uh, that uh, hasn't been done yet. Uh, between Sherburne and Church, it'd be, oh, maybe, $25,000 to repaint the lane lines, which is a real pittance, and it's a real thing to provide the continuity. Uh, and people have died there at uh, Church and uh, uh, Church and Bloor. There was a woman, uh, Karen Gamble, taken away uh, a while back. It's a really nasty, dangerous gauntlet. Sure, it's going to be reconstructed, but I don't think that there's going to be the money sometimes because, hey, we're feeding it out to Scarborough. Uh, and uh, I think that would be a really good thing to start to get a bit of continuity where we need it. Uh, so yes, it's really nice to have some things go on, uh, so keep on going uh, in terms of what you're doing, but quite honestly we need connectivity in the core and the real safety for uh, cyclists in logical places as well. And uh, I'm at the five minutes mark, so please try and uh, fill in that little bit of Bloor Street this uh, year. I'd be happy with the compromise of wider curb lanes and just put down the, uh, the sharrows until you actually do the bike lanes uh, with the reconstruction. Thank you. Any questions for the speaker? Seeing none, we're going to move to questions of staff. I certainly have questions. I don't know if anybody else does. I'll start. Um, the, the recent... Um, oh, you are our guest. Go first, please. No, absolutely. Go ahead. So just on page four, the um, 35 new cameras that were installed, where were they installed? The CC. For you, Madam Chair, the, the, the cameras are being installed on our arterial road intersections. The, uh, there's been a movement to focus on arterial roadways. We have complete coverage of the expressways, and now we're looking at our arterial roadways across the entire city. Okay, so it's not just downtown. There, there are some in Etobicoke, some in different parts of the city. Yeah, so we're looking at uh, critical intersections where it's important to be able to monitor and determine if there's incidents. So there, there could be cameras in Scarborough, Etobicoke, North York, and downtown. Okay. So uh, how, how do you um, um, get that information? Is it from the local council or from communities that have been complaining that this intersection is, uh, needs the cameras and the volume of traffic that, who, who, uh, who uh, uh, analyzes? Uh. It, it's a combination of uh, requests from the counselor's office, but also working with our traffic operations staff who have sort of intimate knowledge of the intersections, as well as working with the uh, police and our collision data to identify those intersections where we've had uh, reoccurring incidents. 
So if I have any in my ward, I can just submit them in? Uh, you, you can pr provide the list to us, Council. We'll be glad to review it. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Councillor Lee, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, can, is it possible to uh, provide a list of uh, all the ones that's been done, so at least we have an idea that uh, what the, uh, the ones that are done, so that uh, as uh, Council Nancy Adams was asking, I mean, if we know what has been done, at least we have uh, ability to be able to, so it can be done, right? Yeah, absolutely, Sri Madam Chair, we can provide a list and we can also put it in a map format so you can see them on a map. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. That is a good question. All right, Any, I, I've got a question. Um, <clears throat> smart signals, or smarter signals, I'll call them. Um, we've, we, we're rolling out two pilots. Um, it, can you just talk a little bit about those pilots? The, the first one's already been installed. Has it all from the whole corridor, or where are we at with the installation of that? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, we've started uh, construction of these smart signals on the Young Street corridor, so that's actively underway. Um, in the subsequent weeks, we'll be starting construction on the second corridor. And how long does it take to actually uh, complete that? Um, our goal is to complete them within a, a couple of months. Um, we need to get ahead of the winter because we do pull the cable through the underground duct system. So in the next number of weeks, there is a possibility that those ducts could freeze up. So the crews, that's their focus right now is pulling underground cable to facilitate uh, the radar and camera units. When do you think you, you'd see an impact from that being fully installed and in place? Like what kind of impact do you think we'll see and when do you think we would see that? Does it take, what, my question is, is it, three months, six months, immediate. I guess people, I think, are curious about that. Um, the, there will be a period of transition when the new system becomes live. There will be a need for tweaks. But following that, which would probably be within the first four weeks, we, we would be expected to see um, potential benefits within the, the three to four month range. Um, we do have a detailed evaluation uh, uh, criteria that we put together to evaluate the effectiveness of the two technologies that we're testing. So could you elaborate on the benefits and then also um, also share with us how you're, you will measure the, the benefits or impacts? So the intended benefits with the new system is to provide real-time signal uh, changes. So um, particularly along the corridors adjacent to the 401 where we see variabilities if there's an incident on the Gardner traffic will migrate down Young Street or Shepherd. And what the signal will, allow, will be allowed to do is to change their signal timing patterns based on real-time data. Traditionally, our existing system has a time of day patterns, so at 10 o'clock the signals will change from north, south, east, west based on a set pattern. But if there's an incident on the 401 and we see an increase of traffic along that corridor, the signal timing can uh, be modified based on actual conditions. Okay, and then what's your, what's your long, um, long term goal on, the, on your end game, I guess, on this? Well, what we hope to see is the, the throughput through those intersections increase compared to the, the baselines. So we have established um, uh, before data. We we're just completing the collection of uh, before data that will be done this week. And we'll use that before data as a baseline to look at travel time, volume, and speed through the area. And so then this pilot, this pilot, then can you just talk a little bit about the purchasing um, aspects of this or how you move the really rolling out more of these across the city if they're successful, which it sounds like they will be. Yeah, we're, we're, we're hopeful that it, uh, we'll see improvements. Um, so we're evaluating two technologies based on the results of those tech technologies. Um, we would then put together an RFP um, to go out to the industry to supply those units. And right now we've, I, we're identifying um, corridors in the city that could benefit from uh, having this technology and those corridors are primarily where we see changes in, in sort of volatility versus standard uh, typical traffic patterns. And um, how many would you would you like to see if you had uh, all the money in the world how many would you like to see across the city? Um, I, I think our, our original design is in the, the neighborhood of about four to five hundred signals um, and again, primarily along those corridors where we see the uh, variability in traffic patterns. We do have corridors where the, the patterns are very stable, um, and we find that the existing system is generally quite responsive to those needs. Excellent, thank you. Other questions, Councillor Holliday. 
At the start of the term, I listened very carefully to Councillor Peruzza one day, who said <laughs> something really wise. Yeah. Oh, the chair is smiling, but he, he was right. He talked about um, how sometimes local councils and council gets carried away with local controls in, in neighborhoods. And part of the reason was a response to congestion, you know, the busy artery. Uh, cars are infiltrating into quieter streets. And so people put up, do not enter, don't turn, one way, speed hump, stop sign, extra lights, those kinds of things as a way to, to try to change the traffic flow, right? That we know it works like a hydraulic system, right? You squeeze one valve, it goes somewhere else. But it, it has always struck me, and I think the councillor alluded to it, that <clears throat> part of the, the congestion um, is due to our own engineering. And I mean that as council's engineering on these things. And I wondered with what it would take, so my question is to staff, is what would it take with all of these reports that come to us, to council on speed humps, spot, stop signs, extra traffic lights, where often they're recommended against, what would it take to get a paragraph in there that gives comment to the effect on congestion? And uh, maybe just some, some um, appraisal of what you'd consider, you think councillors would listen to it or you think they would just put it aside and are there any effective statements that we could make that would help with the decision making process so we consider the big picture? Through you, Madam Chair, I think um, that traffic engineering uh, in relation to congestion has to be set in appropriate context, and I think it would be very valuable to kind of set the baseline with the knowledge that um, in Toronto, part of the, the value of the interaction in, in, um, with the community is uh, understanding local needs, and so there has to be a balance between understanding impacts to the overall system and responding to local conditions. Um, I do think we have some examples in the city and I think it would be good to start uh, putting forth more examples where we could look more contextually at, uh, at traffic plans so that we could uh, I understand how these impacts had a, uh, a more far-reaching effect. And, and I those, those assessments do occur uh, when we're planning and doing the, uh, the traffic analysis for individual proposals that come forward. Uh, but I think it would be good to start moving uh, in, in more of that direction. I, I agree that it does have an impact on congestion. Good, okay, any other questions? If not, we'll move to speakers. I'm gonna speak on this if nobody else is. I don't have any motions, but I wanna just um, acknowledge the good work of our transportation division, who I think really, um, we all know we're at a bit of a watershed moment when, it, when we're looking at incorporating technologies into our congestion management strategies, new technologies, and it's very challenging for staff because the technologies keep changing. You know, you do an RFP and everything's shifted. Yeah, it's incredible how quickly in advance this whole system is, the ITS. And so I do want to uh, just take a moment to thank, you know, we, we often hear from Barbara Gray and, and Kip uh, and sometimes Miles, but I do want to acknowledge Greg Lone, who's in the second row back there, Wave Greg, who's done a lot of work on this front. He's like a mini Einstein when it comes to uh, ITS and, and congestion management, and he knows it all, and we're very fortunate to have him at the city. So I think it's important to, to take a moment and recognize Greg's work. Um, along with uh, Barbara and Miles, who also um, have done great, made great strides on this, particularly Miles, as you've heard, because he's very informed and on top of this. So I think we can't take any of this lightly. Uh, we are not going to be building new roadways. We're not going to be expanding physically the capacity of our roadways. In fact, we're probably going to be only shrinking them. So it's very important we pay close attention to this. Uh, we're going to be getting semi-annual updates on this issue, and uh, the last, I think, number that came out of CD Howe was $11 billion per year, and that's what it's costing Toronto, uh, congestion and gridlock in our city. So um, that is a number to keep our eye on, and we want to make sure we are productive and, and we can move people around the city. And uh, you may have heard the mayor speak recently about uh, ways and hear technology and big data. I think these are all um, uh, big passions for Greg and he's been working hard to make sure those are incorporated into our, our current state of traffic uh, here in Toronto. So um, I just think it's, uh, I think I, I feel very proud. I'm sure the whole committee is very proud to see these measures unveiled new adaptive traffic signals, uh, as I call them, smarter signals. And um, this is, I think, going to really help us down the road with uh, what I hear about 
not daily, but hourly in my ward. Uh, I've had comments, very harsh comments from people saying they're so fed up they've considered moving out of the city because of congestion and gridlock. Um, they feel transit is not there. Uh, you get on the, the subway, if you are lucky enough to get on, uh, you're like a sardine. And then line one, certainly the last three times I've been on it, uh, today, yesterday, and, and um, earlier this week, or last week, it was actually Friday, um, constant delays on line one. And so people feel, well, we can't drive, we can't use transit, so we're gonna get in our car, and then they get in their car and they can't get around the city. So these measures being put in place are innovative, um, and like never before, whether it's snowplow monitoring or delivery of uh, applying brine um, in our snow operations, r right through to moving people around the city, this transportation division is like never before incorporating technology and using it to really find their way forward. So I think that's a great watershed moment for um, the city, for transportation services, and for our residents. On that, I would move the, um, the staff recommendation. Oh, I guess there's really no staff recommendations because it's an information report. So do we receive the information report? And sorry? Adopt the, recommend the recommendations? Okay, just to receive. So receive for information, all in favor, opposed, that carries. All right, so our next item is PW 25.4. And I don't know if we have a speaker on this item, do we, or? No, no, we approved that one. So I think we're on 25, actually, 0. 0.9. And that is the next steps for developing a third green bin organics processing facility. I know we have a speaker, at least one speaker on this. And we have a supplementary report. I don't know if the committee was aware there's a supplementary report, so make sure you check that out. Um, so the item is uh, PW 25.9, third, third green bin organics. Uh, there's a supplementary report, and um, we have at least one speaker, and it's uh, Emily, our friend Emily from T. Come on up, Emily, and uh, get situated and I will start your time. Oh, and I think, no, I think it's just Emily. I think that's the only speaker. Okay, go ahead. Good morning. Uh, thanks for having me here to speak today. So my name is Emily Alfred. I'm the waste campaigner for the Toronto Environmental Alliance. We're a nonprofit environmental organization and we have 60,000 supporters across Toronto. Our supporters care about zero waste and are happy to see Toronto become a zero waste city. So I'm here today to chat about the next steps for developing a third green bin organics processing facility. As I've said probably to this committee before as well to the budget committee, we believe that focusing on organics first is one of the best ways that Toronto can meet its environmental targets in terms of reducing waste, going to landfill, and in terms of having the biggest greenhouse gas impact. I'm happy to see a lot of the information in the staff report is something that we totally agree with. And the real question that's coming up in this in this report is not whether we need more green bin capacity, it's when. So I just wanna show you a little chart. So in the staff report on page four, staff made a chart outlining the organics processing capacity that the city currently has and the projected increased organics that the city expects to capture in the next few years from the green bin. And we've made a little variation on this chart because I think there's some numbers missing from the city's chart. So the blue bars are the city's existing capacity to collect organics in city-owned anaerobic digesters. This lower line here is showing the expected organics that the city will be collecting in the green bin. But what we're showing is that red line at the top is the actual amount of organics that the city could be collecting because that's the, that's the total amount of organics, including the organics that are currently going to landfill. So this is organics that people are putting in the garbage by mistake. They don't, maybe they live in a multi-res building, they don't have access to organics that is very convenient for them. So when we look at the total amount of organics that could be managed in the city's municipal system from just municipal customers, I think that we can see that the capacity gap is a lot bigger than just 10,000 tons. Sure, uh, no, I'm not finished yet. Cool, okay. So the other important point about this is that staff have said, sorry, I'm just gonna look for my note. 
I believe staff noticed or staff noted that there's currently insufficient capacity in Toronto. We're 10,000 tons below what we need. I think that's much higher in terms of hundreds of thousands of tons. And what the staff pointed out is that we may be forced to landfill our green bin waste if we don't have enough organics capacity. This is partly because there's increasing pressure in Ontario for organics capacity. There's already a shortage Ontario-wide. The province has just announced the organics framework and that's the secondary staff report that you may not have all had a chance to look at. But the province has made it clear that it plans to ban the disposal of organics from landfill. So all of this organic material that is currently going to landfill would have to come out of the garbage bag. This also means that other businesses in Toronto would have to start collecting organics and they'd have an incentive to look at city service. And all other municipalities in Ontario would start having to collect organics. So it would increase the competition for the very few organics processors that are still taking um, outside tons. So this, I think, is a good reason for Toronto to look at building a third organics digester as soon as possible. Um, if it's city-owned, it can reduce the transportation costs, the greenhouse gas emissions associated with transportation. It creates local jobs. Toronto can also profit from the renewable natural gas created from an anaerobic digester. It can also sell excess capacity to other municipalities that are going to desperately be looking for it in the very near future. So um, while staff have outlined a plan to report back on this and to look at creating a regional processor, I would suggest that Toronto having its own processor makes the most sense. It provides the most stability for Toronto and that we should fast track any sort of efforts to get an anaerobic digester in Toronto. Um, maybe a report back sooner based after the provincial organics framework has been passed. There is expected to be some announced funding available to implement that, implement that organics framework. So potentially it would be great to hear from staff on what uh, funding opportunities are available for this organics processor. So that's a quick summary of my comments, but I'm very happy to answer your question. Thank you. I think, or you are articulating, but it, I guess what I want to make sure we, we're, we're correct in our interpretation is that uh, the, the timelines, is that a good summary? Yeah, it's the timelines because currently there's sort of a projection that um, it will take about eight to ten years to actually get a digester built, sited, permitted and up and running. And if we're looking at a potential organics ban for the province starting in 2022 or 23, that's a lot sooner than eight to 10 years. So Toronto would need to start moving on it as quickly as possible to be prepared for new provincial regulations. Okay, so I'm gonna ask staff about that when I have a chance. Any other questions for Emily? Seeing none, okay, we'll move to questions of staff. Um, I, I've got a question, do you have a question, Councillor Lee? No, I've got a question and that is just, um, I guess what is, the, what is the biggest delay for you in this process? What, is, what are your challenges, I guess, to get this moving forward? So, so Councillor, there's uh, on it's table one on page seven where we outlined the, the various time frames to go through all this, um, and we, you know, based on our experience with the last one that we we cited and constructed eight to ten years, um, there are ways to shorten up the time frames on a number of these um, citing and planning and approvals. Really, what that comes down to is um, just how much controversy do you have with the site around you and how long it's going to take to actually get through the approvals process. Um, the supplemental report that we prepared was based on the new organics framework that came out after the original report was complete and, and with clerks. Um, one of the things that they mentioned in there that we've been pushing for as well is that there needs to be a streamlining of the Ministry of the Environment approvals processes in order to be able to meet their own timelines. <laughs> and that is one of the biggest barriers. So as much as we agree with fast tracking this, they in fact are one of the problems with being able to fast track it because their approvals process takes so long. So that's, it's good to see in the framework that they're at least acknowledging now that they may in fact be part of the problem, um, but it'll be, it'll be working with them in order to try and fast track the approvals, which really is what takes the, the longest and is probably the biggest risk and uncertainty in moving a project like this forward. Okay, I couldn't help but chuckle about that. Um, so what, is there anything council could do to help you to address the Ministry of Environment piece of this? Is there, uh, or committee? 
Certainly, uh, we, we have a very, very good working relationship with the ministry. Uh, we're working hand in hand in a lot of this stuff, helping to identify solutions to some of the challenges that they face as well in terms of approvals, making suggestions. I don't think we're at a point yet where a, a letter from council would support that, but certainly if we get to that point, I may come back and suggest that council needs to provide some sort of uh, uh, letter back to the province indicating some of our concerns with being able to meet these timelines and maybe some suggestions that help improve the process overall. Okay, and so basically the biggest delay is the approval process. Is that, was that what you would... Well, and there, so there's the approvals going. process and the uncertainty and the risk around siting is, is always one. Um, procurement, how quickly we can go through a procurement process and, and go through the negotiations with a vendor and then ultimately construction, you know, on a, on a what would be a $100 million plus construction project, there's always the potential for delays. Um, what we'll do is, as part of what this report lays out, is we'll come back with a full timeline and we'll identify opportunities to fast track in some of those timelines, especially now given this very aggressive date that the province has set in this new framework. Yes, okay, well that's very helpful. Thank you for that, uh, that summary. Any other questions for staff? Seeing none, we'll move to speaker. Oh, councillor, please go ahead, councillor. Another question, but just a comment. Yeah, go ahead. Go speak on that. Maybe, maybe it would be appropriate then to put a, a motion through. It sounds like that. Maybe, at, maybe at council requesting the province, and as well, then the members of council as well could um, go directly to their MPPs. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. And, and highlight it because I don't think that the MPPs are aware of it. Um, you know, so maybe that would be a good Okay, thing. so that's a really good idea, except that apparently this item isn't going to council. The clerk has just told me. So we could move it here. Should, do we, would we like to do that here? Yeah, we could do that. Sorry, what are you suggesting? Okay, so why don't, why don't, why don't I move a motion um, based on Councillor Annunziata's suggestion, I think it's a great one that um, we ask staff to, um, we direct staff to, uh, to draft or compose a letter uh, encouraging um, the timelines, addressing the timelines and our concerns with the uh, progress or the ability to facilitate that. Uh, we have a comment over here, go ahead. Yeah, if I can just add, Councillor, so we, this organics framework is out for consultation right now, so we'll be doing a full review and submitting comments as staff on it, but certainly something like that we could include with our actual comments going into the province, um, and it'll, it'll carry much more weight if, if you guys are certainly supporting it than just get staff comments. Okay, can you actually just uh, turn on your mic and say what, and give us a, uh, what the problem? So if uh, you would give um, the committee would give direction to the general manager to include in his comments uh, to the province the um, need for accelerated timelines and reduction in the uh, um, steps necessary, the reduction in the requirements, uh, timing requirements of provincial uh, approvals. All right, all those in favor of that, is that okay? It's going to city council. It's kind of a motherhood thing, but that will go to the city council? Yeah, let's hold this item down. Yep. All right, thank you to our speakers. We're gonna move on to our next item and then come back to this. So our next item, and what is our next item, 13? Oh, 10, sorry. Oh yes, and we have a speaker on 10. So PW 25.10, Hamish come up to the mic. Um, and uh, this is this is Vision Zero Road Safety Plan. I think we only have one speaker on this, if I'm correct, but you have five minutes, um, Hamish. And again, good morning. Thanks for being here, folks. Uh, sometimes it's easier for some of us to make it down than others. Um, and, oh, I got the Dorings file. That's not it. Uh, we want the Vision Zero update. And it's nice to have a little bit of sense that we have uh, an awareness of this program uh, beginning. Uh, and some actions on it. Uh, I'm a little bit of a curmudgeon, I suppose, and I don't want to be quite so negative about uh, what we're doing and what we're not doing. Uh, this is a great old cartoon, by the way. Uh, Got to try and laugh. 
Oh, I guess everybody's busy on things. Okay, well, uh, in terms of what the, uh, the problems are, it tends to be uh, damages from the cars rather than uh, the pedestrians or the cyclists injuring the, uh, the car drivers, although with respect, uh, the, uh, the cyclists sometimes, we are difficult and we do injure people and that's really, sometimes we kill them too and it's really unfortunate. And it's really nice to see uh, some of the signs of changes at other large world-level cities, but I'm still thinking that we need to catch up with, uh, say, Hamilton and Guelph sometimes. Um, so with recommendations, ask the provincial government and or federal level to ensure that penalties for killing vulnerable road users be stiffened and not limited to an automatic long-term suspension of driving privileges. Uh, so there's a minimum of four years worth of avoidance of uh, that any person who kills a vulnerable road user uh, have it four years that you can't drive. Uh, because the, I'm thinking of that uh, recent uh, uh, travesty uh, yet again, of uh, the the woman uh, who was uh, killed uh, while walking her dogs on uh, uh, where was it? It was uh, Gerard, I guess. I think it was Gerard, and it was in the press recently that the uh, the driver uh, really didn't have penalty, and that's unfortunate. Um, Make sure that you read and apply the places to grow legislation, especially 3.2.2 and 3.2.3, .3, and include raised crosswalks as part of the suite of measures for standard uh, uh, prote protective practice. Um, say when you're reconstructing Bloor Street in the next little while, make sure that there are raised tables uh, and raised crosswalks. And going back to the, uh, uh, you know, say crossing over the Gardner exit and ramps, those uh, that would be another great place to have put them or put them. Uh, reactivate uh, the pedestrian and cycling advisory committees with staff support and allow them to vet proposals for cost sharings and designs and all the other things. Um, I think we really miss having these uh, advisory committees uh, to make sure that we don't take up your, quite as much of your time here at uh, Public Works and uh, uh, that you get a screening of some of the advocacy positions ahead of actually uh, doing, uh, doing proposals. Uh, provide effective transit and keep fares frozen. I really think it's a wonderful idea that we're having that uh, 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 two-hour uh, pass extension. If you need the money, I would suggest that uh, there's a headline from the, uh, the Guardian, three billion subway station, and they actually got it wrong because it's 3.35 uh, in terms of the first of the list uh, of their uh, white elephants globally. It was Toronto's. Number one, uh, they provided a, the email confirmation that they, uh, you know, they, they got the figure wrong. It's 3.35, so I'm glad they care about $350 million worth and counting or whatever it is. Um, so if you need the money to keep the uh, fares frozen and low, I would suggest uh, avoiding that Scarborough subway extension and applying it properly. Uh, downtown driving ban favored by 60% in poll. That's another thing to really help uh, uh, keep things low. And there's another headline. Last month predicts automobile free downtown by 2011. That's another thing that would help to reduce the car, the carnage. Uh, oh yeah, here's another image. You know, it doesn't necessarily help. That's the sort of pinch point that uh, should be avoided, please. Uh, this was in the past, not too long ago. Um, and reinstate the uh, vehicle registration tax and ask the province to introduce per and permit different rates for classes of vehicles and ensure that the funds are directly and clearly allocated to budgets like the TTC capital budget and the low income passes and the cost of even this uh, Vision Zero program. I think that would be a, another really good targeted uh, spot for any funding uh, that is raised from the vehicle registration tax because just putting it into general re revenue sometimes really irks people. So if it's a clear targeted tax raising, I think people will go along with it. Lower speed limits on all the major car arterials to 40 kilometers an hour. And I think that's one of the key things that needs to be done uh, system-wide. We've done good things in the residential areas, uh, in some of the residential areas, but we need to actually uh, do it for the rest of the car arterials. Uh, this is where uh, Gord uh, got some of his profile. This is an older column, uh, Blood in the Streets. Uh, I'd suggest that's uh, still worth reading. And in terms of uh, facts and getting get data, I, uh, it, data collection's great, but what are you going to do with it? Uh, if it's just going to be bypassed again after the decades, uh, quite honestly, it's pretty frustrating because um, th th we've, we've seen a clear pattern of harm and crash over the decades uh, of the cyclists to the cyclists uh, from, um, you know, uh, the, the data collection, and it clearly shows a pattern of harm and crash. 
Oh, how it's astounding how that happens, and I didn't get through my list. Thank you. Yes. Roadway or sidewalk that we use the Vision Zero lens. I, uh, my, my sense from being out on the streets, Chair Robinson, I really aren't seeing that much evidence. Well, of well, that staff have taken that approach for for some time now. So well, when anything's being reconstructed, it. that just makes actual financial sense sense to do that. Um, so whenever crosswalks. we're reconstructing things, we're doing it uh, with that lens. I don't see the raised crosswalks. To get back to your question, that would be one thing. Okay. Or the well, bike lanes. Uh, those are being implemented when we're down. doing reconstruction. When Lansdowne was being rebuilt, there weren't, uh, you know, north of uh, north of Bloor, there weren't any uh, bike lanes put in that, even though uh, it was in the bike plan. And um, or Broadview. The other thing is, I wanted to comment on: Are you aware that we've accelerated this since since it was adopted by council in July of 2016? We actually accelerated it that fall, or, and as well in 2017. Are you aware that we've accelerated the the report? Beautifully outlined the accelerations and expansions. Did you did you have an opportunity to read that? I, I did scan the report, quite honestly. But again, I would point out these uh, these uh, these harm and crash uh, statistics. Uh, that to me, I didn't, don't think you're responding to it. And uh, sure, you're, uh, uh, let's see, where is it? Do I have it here? You know, in the back, uh, his background to the bike strategy, they actually discount the worth of uh, urban cyclists as opposed to uh, more suburban cyclists. So to me, the Vision Zero, uh, it needs to be applied to cyclists in a consistent, systematic, and thoughtful way. And I'm not necessarily seeing it because we're getting still a much of a patchwork and a knot work. If you're well, really I think serious about it, Chair yeah. Robinson, there's a section of Parliament that was just repaved this summer. Smooth pavement, it's great. Going northbound. If you wanted to actually provide the continuity and get me away from you, then you would have provided safety for cyclists from the end of Wellesley up to the Bluer bike lanes. And no, this wasn't done. It's a status quo repaving. It's very frustrating. And not only status quo, you neglected to actually put the smooth pavement up to the bluer bike lanes. So right at that pinch point of a curve, and motorists always, when any vehicle, when it turns right, always pinches the corner. You haven't even put in 200 bucks or okay, 600 or 1,000 bucks worth of uh, bike symbols. Our time's up. You aren't doing it. Thank you. So, uh, and I don't think there's any other questions, and that's our only speaker. So, we're going to move to questions of staff. Is, there, is this need to be addressed through questions? This piece of the your your thing of the donation. Do you know your donation? Wasn't there a motion about donation? Um, I have a question. So, uh, oh, you guys both have questions. Okay, Councillor Nunziata. Yeah, thank you. Um, in in the report on the pilot school selected for early completion, so how 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 did these schools get uh, selected and meet the warrants? I I, I don't believe I I don't believe that the councillors were no notified to bring in a list of their schools. Through you, Madam Speaker, the, the Vision Zero Road Safety Plan uh, priorities are driven uh, solely by data. And so we do data analysis about uh, killed and serious injury collisions that happen on the roadways in proximity to schools, and that's how we rank those schools. And walkability as well. Okay, so we can then, members of council can bring those um, locations board uh. Th through you uh, absolutely if there are issues and concerns around specific schools that there's uh, opportunity to bring the vision zero message out to uh, to the community in your ward and talk about that we've started doing some of those approaches as well and we're happy to continue to do so it, it will remain a data-driven analysis now what about these um, watch your speed um, uh, signs um, I, I know that we put them up in different areas, so what is the process for that? Okay. 
Uh, through you, Madam Chair, uh, there is a warrant process that uh, went with a previous staff report where basically you re request uh, watch a speed sign uh, within your ward at a specific location, and then there's a whole process in terms of data collection and analysis that we would then confirm whether or not it's approved, and then subsequently the staff would re respond back to you to confirm whether or not it met the criteria for advancement. Because we have been putting our request di uh, uh, directly to Etobicoke, and yeah, and we're, we're getting negative response on that. So I'm just wondering how I could connect and, you know, get some of these areas um, signed, properly signed. So, uh, you know, I'm, because we, we always get, ne we, we all, we're always told no. So I, I just need to know what the process is. So I come directly to you. Yeah, through you, Madam Chair, we could share the criteria with you in terms of what's used to evaluate um, whether a school is eligible versus not. Yeah. Okay, now, as far as the point that was made, um, when we're resurfacing major, um, major roads, um, arterial roads, do we, are we advised that uh, the councillors or uh, the community um, on possibly putting bike lanes on these on these roads that we're resurfacing, um, is the message is a message out there to the councillors and to the community? We're resurfacing this major arterial road. Uh, would you like bike lanes? Through you, and, and so we can uh, do uh, the proper consultation uh, with businesses and with the, with the residents. Through you, uh, Madam Speaker, when uh, we, we follow in terms of bike lane implementation, we follow the 10-year cycling plan, and, and uh, we also try to coordinate the work as best we can through our uh, municipal construction coordination group. And so when we are doing uh, a road resurfacing or a road reconstruction is an ideal time for us to look at how the road is configured, but we will look to the 10-year cycling plan to advance that, and we typically, uh, we have to bring each one of those back through council, so there is typically a notice of about when we're moving one of those projects forward that comes through this committee. Yeah, but wouldn't, wouldn't it make more sense that we, we fast track that? I mean, if a road's being resurfaced, it's not gonna be resurfaced for another 20 years, so why wouldn't we do it at the time that we're actually resurfacing the road? In so, the you know, I know, but we should make it in the contract. I I yeah, I mean, I mean, like, if we're doing it, then we should, we should expedite that and not wait for the 10-year plan because it's, it's really silly to be spending all this money resurfacing roads and then the communities, well, why didn't we, why weren't we asked to put bike lane? And uh, through you, we're gonna be coming back uh, in 2018 with the uh, progress to date on the 10-year cycling plan and opportunities to look at that uh, again in more detail in terms of the, the rollout. Um, certainly other jurisdictions do, and we do as well, look for opportunities when we do uh, resurfacing. Um, and in some cases, uh, having the resurfacing accomplished in one year and then coming back to do some line work in a future year is not a, a major, it's not a major cost element. It's more about engaging the community in that. So making sure that we have uh, everybody aligned or at least as much as we can in, in terms of moving those projects forward. Yeah, because I have um, I have a, a, a cycling committee that was just formed in my ward and um, there's a number of roads that are being resurfaced and the question was asked why why were we not asked to put bicycle lanes? So I guess we should be coordinating that. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Davis is next. <clears throat> so I, I just want to clarify, what we have before us is the letter, decision letter from the committee? Or there is... No, well, there's a report. There's here. a supplementary report. No, here. It's part of the agenda. Here. Yes, it's got the Vision Zero yeah. presentation yeah. in it that was given to the school's advisory committee and the recommendation before us, I presume, is the one from the committee. Is that the case? Through you, Madam Chair, there's a, um, a report and that uh, letter and um, communication with the school board is an appendix to that report. Okay. Okay. So this responds to the request for an acceleration uh, report, and you're recommending um, expanding, because if we went at 20 schools per year, how many years would it take? 
to do 780 schools. <clears throat> I calculated 30, close to 35 years if we went at the pace of 20 a year. Okay, so the, there is demand to do it at more schools and faster. But I did want to confirm once again, if um, local uh, councillors and local school communities are working on developing their own approach to uh, a comprehensive approach to how to improve safety around their local school, working with uh, transportation staff, that work will still go ahead. There's no, we're not going to slow things down or redirect those resources elsewhere. Through, through you, uh, Madam Chair, that is correct. We are continuing to do work. There are other countermeasures in the plan that we are not currently proposing for acceleration as part of this plan that will continue to, to move forward as they are. Okay. And you're looking at the feasibility of adopting administrative penalty system for both the red light camera program and the ASE program. Oh, okay. You have to get in line <laughs> with the alternative penalty system. I think uh, MLS is next with the uh, uh, with the um, audit program for for the uh, licensing of apartment buildings. Are we ready to be able to expand the APS into several other areas? Thank you, Madam Chair. Through you. Um, we are looking at expanding the administrative penalty system in a number of areas. There are two significant issues that we have to deal with as a city to do so. Um, with respect to uh, programs that are under our own bylaws, we do not need legislative change. For the red light camera and for the automated speed enforcement, we do need provincial legislative change. But the other most significant issue is a capital project to build an IT solution for us to be able to do it. So that is the most significant other hurdle that we have to get. And that IT solution would allow you to expand to uh, other areas then? That is correct. Do you still require that for the um, um, rent safe or multi-res apartment APS? That is correct. That is ah. something that are, we are in discussions with. And we are looking at trying to create one IT solution that would allow us to bring in all matters rather than multiple IT solutions. Right. And is that in the 2018 budget? It, it is not. It is something that we are in discussions with, with a, a variety of divisions who are interested in bringing administrative penalties to bring forward a report with respect to a capital project on that. Well, if it doesn't go in the 2018 budget, we're not going to see it until at least 2020, so, or 2021. That is not what we had expected on the uh, apartment building bylaw. Um, maybe there's some way we can request that that be ex <laughs> that the IT solution and business case be expedited to be included in the 2018 uh, budget. Is that feasible? Uh, through you, uh, Madam Chair, I, I believe that uh, the support of the committee and council to uh, expedite that process would be helpful. Okay. Um, how, however, it, it is going to take some time to put it together, the, the proposal. But if council directs you then and to use whatever resources are required, you could probably do that? Uh, we, we could do our best to try to expedite it as quickly as possible, but we are subject to the avail availability of corporate IT to support the project and the other divisions and, and, corporate, fun and corporate city funding for it. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm just going over with, this is the supplemental report and the actual report on the update was not included in the agenda that was first sent around. I'm just establishing that because my colleagues don't actually. You, the have the that. report w should have been. Uh, it was it was posted. It should have been uh, part of the package. It came after the package supplemental. So, yeah. Yeah, I okay, yep. so uh, there's just some confusion because no one has the actual report. I have read the actual report, and um, want to just ask a few questions and clarifying that the advice to the committee 
from the City School Board's Advisory Committee. What are the steps for that? There is no vote at Council for that. Um, I just to be clear with the clerks, Madam Chair, I'm being clear with the clerks. 10A, which is advice from the City School Board's Advisory Committee, its status, I'm clarifying, is only here at this committee and Council will never see that advice. Is that true? Okay, so can you hold my time while you figure that part out? So to be really clear what my question is, uh, so I get the answer, that the school board has an advisory committee, the school boards, that advise through this committee, and this committee has the ability to accept or reject the advice, and this would never see counsel. It's only for this committee. I'm just asking you to clarify that through the clerks, number one. That's my first question. Somehow I've used, yeah. Just the status of that type of advice. Yeah. Because we're, we're um, not clear. What you're saying is on a, on a continual basis, going that, forward, not just once, but do you mean once or I'm on a I'm talking about basis? this came here from the City School Board's Advisory Committee and then it's up to the, I'm clarifying with the clerk, I guess through you, Madam Chair, that this would, um, you would have to, you would have to, at this committee, would have to support the advice. This committee does not give direct advice to the general manager of transportation that, I'm sorry, the school board committee does not give advice directly to the general manager. They have some advice for the general manager it has to come to this committee and be forwarded to the general manager. I'm just being, sorry to be so picky. I just- No, 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 yeah, yeah, we're not even clear ourselves. So I think that is accurate. What, which is accurate, what I just said? That it, it, right. that it would come to this body. So it's before you, it would need to be specifically moved to, in order to be adopted. Or to even to refer, just to refer it to the general manager. Correct. This would committee would adopted. have the ability those, to refer those, or not refer, but technically this committee should act on this advice one way or another from the school board's advisory committee because it's a city committee giving advice to the general manager through. I just know this all from, this, from the uh, film board. This committee can act or not act. Could not act on advice from one of its committees. Correct. Okay. So that, uh, and would, uh, would the school board's advisory committee be advised that the committee took no action? Uh, not specifically. Why would that But be? if somebody raises it, it could be uh, provided back to them and it's public information as well. Okay, so that's just to clarify that relationship that- It doesn't go back on the agenda for the city school boards automatically, no. Okay, so that is just to clarify. So then following up on a couple of things that we have these um, tools in our toolkit for Vision Zero. Uh, I have a lot of things around schools. I've got bollards at schools that are on the sidewalk in front of the school so parents aren't able to drive up and drop the child off. Is that part of our toolkit? I don't see it there. Through you, Madam uh, Chair, uh, I wouldn't say that's specifically part of our toolkit. Uh, what we have in the school safety zones, uh, the countermeasures that we have there are those that we are looking at to use re repeated, repeatedly in school zones across the city. There are other tools and techniques that we might use. Uh, this issue was raised uh, also related to traffic calming on adjacent streets to address speed issues. And while it might be may not be explicit in the toolkit, if the area warrants it and we believe that it will help to solve the challenge that the school is experiencing, Experiencing, then we would we would likely recommend putting things forward in that way as well. Would you agree with me that um, pick up and drop off zones are a useful a useful thing for a school zone? Through you, if designed properly, I would agree with you. Yes. Would you agree with me that a bump out is a good design to slow traffic down coming up to a school zone? 
through you, uh, it depends on the scenario uh, and the specific Possibly. site. I would, I would agree that bump outs are quite useful in terms of shortening crossing distance for pedestrians and... And would you agree with me that some, at times, term prohibitions might be useful in order to keep cars from overwhelming uh, a street? Through you, again, in a site-specific conditions, term prohibitions can be quite useful. And then you'd agree with me that bollards could be useful in to maintain a safer zone around the school. Through you, again, site-specifically, they can be. But you'd have to have sidewalks there first in order to put a bollard, basically. Would you agree? Through you, uh, typically, you would typically have a sidewalk. Typically, you'd need that. Yeah. So just on, those are a number of things, including speed humps, that actually, I did find speed humps listed in the uh, safety plan, correct? I saw you reference speed humps as an, uh, for the first time that it is actually being advocated by the division. Would I be right that I read that in the report? Through you, uh, my understanding is uh, Transportation Services has been installing speed humps as a speed control measure for, for some time. Um, I've never seen a positive report. Would that surprise you? Ever. <laughs> Never. In my entire career. No, ever. No one has. Ever. No, Would that you, surprise you? Uh, a positive report from the department supporting the use Correct. of speed humps? Yeah, that, through you, they're, they're a con controversial tool. Uh, so I guess it wouldn't surprise me. So if we asked you to say how many times have speed humps been suggested, even if it doesn't meet the warrants, then it would be zero. Probably. You don't have to comment. Just so, just on the accelerations, um, so those that I listed there, those are ones that are in use already in many different school zones. And uh, I'll speak about that after, but there's a little concern that since we don't have kind of what I call a secondary suite, that it looks like nothing's happened in school zones because there's not all these other things going on. Would that be fair to say? Uh, through you, I, I think that there's that the been a. The city hasn't been active in school zones already. Through, through you, I, I'm I'm able to comment sort of on the proposal from Vision Zero and what we've done this year uh, has been ramping up our activities in school zones because as one of the more vulnerable users of the right of way, young children uh, require that extra attention, and uh, we've been focusing on that and advancing, accelerating, if you will, in the words of this report, uh, our activities in school zones so that we can help. Uh, support that can, goal. Can I also find out how a six, seven and eight school um, got on for school zone review, whereas the r younger, you know, the schools of kids from K to eight, K to six on arterial roads didn't make it, but one that is on a very quiet one way street, bike lane, etc., for a senior school somehow is up for review. I'm unclear as to what the criteria would be for that. Through you, with the Vision Zero Road Safety Plan, we base our priorities specifically on the uh, the data, where we've had uh, a number of killed or serious injury collisions. So you could show me that data. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, are you finished, Councillor Fletcher? You're on time, very well done. All right, uh, we're gonna move into committee now, and any questions, I know there are a few questions. Uh, Councillor Carmichael, grab. Go ahead. Thank you. In regards to the um, donations for uh, for um, part, parts of the plan, such as uh, watch your speed sides, could you expand on that a little more? Through you, Madam uh, Chair. Yes, absolutely. Um, we were asked by Council to look at uh, donations uh, option or program uh, as part of Vision Zero. One of the things, as I've mentioned a couple of times uh, in responses, is the Vision Zero plan is a, a strictly data-driven plan, and so we rank and prioritize investments based on the data that we find. Um, we, we are approached every now and again by uh, community groups uh, or individuals who are interested in understanding how they can contribute to supporting uh, goals of the city. Um, we've seen that, uh, and because of, the uh, because of the request that Council made to us, we went out and did an analysis of 
of what that would be like to do a donations program uh, as for, for specific impacts or issues or countermeasures. And I think the one that comes to mind that you, that you uh, recognize is the watch your speed sign. Um, in general, uh, we we have a you know a budget allocation for the Vision Zero Road Safety Plan. We continue to move forward with that. We uh, the the fact that this is a data driven proposal ensures that there's equity related to how that gets distributed and that we're actually implementing our um, countermeasures based on true need. Uh, and so we will continue, as we say in the report, we will continue to explore what that looks like. We looked at other um, agencies in the city, like Animal Services and some others, to see if it was feasible. That was the request of us. Is it feasible to move forward with that kind of uh, analysis? And so we've said, yes, it is feasible. Uh, whether we would move forward with it or not uh, in the future still requires some significant analysis. So if part of this then is if a residence association or a school group wanted to purchase a watch your speed sign that would go in an area and be moved around, um, that, that's sort of the intention of this? Through you, that's what we are assessing the feasibility of, yes. And, and again, other uh, agencies in the cities have done that, in the city have done that, and so uh, we believe it's possible to do that. Uh, I think there's a lot of questions still to be answered about how that would be uh, ramped up and uh, how we would ensure equity in terms of delivery if we were to move in that direction. Would you be able to do a supplementary report for council just to clarify all of that? Uh, thank you. I, I think it would be very helpful to clarify as we, we really did kind of a brief uh, overview of what we learned and I think it would be helpful to clarify that so we'll be happy to do that. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Thank you. Um, any other questions from the committee? Councillor Holliday has a couple. Oh. Do you want to speak or ask questions? Uh, I will ask questions. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. <laughs> All right, um, Madam Chair, my time. Okay. Um, I just wanted to carry on about the questions from uh, Councillor Carmichael Greb. Um, in, uh, I've been aware in my dealings that sometimes control interventions can become very, very political, um, and they can become a commodity. And we have great warrants and processes around to ensure that interventions are not made as, as uh, political actions, but actually respond to data, respond to risks, respond to incidences. Um, would, I, would I be correct in assuming that you might take that into consideration on any supplemental report on ensuring that, uh, that if donations come up or, or requests or asks or opportunities or resource offers, that uh, that there's a lens put towards it just beyond equity and just looking at to ensure they are things that are going to be useful, they're going to uh, to save lives, uh, and that they um, they consider all of those dimensions. Through you, Madam uh, Speaker, Chair, rather, excuse me, uh, absolutely, that's, um, that is one of the things that I, I, we would absolutely put that lens to it, and also um, I believe that in terms of where you could uh, reasonably apply uh, some kind of a donation. I think the description that Councillor Carmichael Greb made about a sign, a watch your speed sign, uh, that gets moved around the community uh, based on the data and where we have safety issues is, is, a, is an, um, a reasonable example. Okay, and we're not going to be crowdfunding uh, stop signs and things like that. Do you... Uh, I don't believe we've mentioned the term crowdfunding, although I believe I've seen it attached yeah. to this report. So no, we, we don't believe we'll be crowdfunding anything, and uh, we also believe there's a lot more work to do in analysis before we would be able to come forward with a specific recommendation about how this would be implemented. Would it be if, fair to say that these types of interventions that often are requested are generally not about the money, but more about the policy and equity? Through you, that's absolutely true. Okay, uh, I have a, a very technical question, actually. I recall um, when we were discussing the, the early uh, genesis of the permanent watcher speed installations, uh, the data said that those signs were useful um, or were optimal for the first year or two. And then after that, what we found was, was drivers would begin to um, pay less attention to them. And I, I, I believe that because it's just a human, a human fact. Um, it's a long program. Um, the signs are, are, are somewhat permanently installed. 
is there a look to the future to actually begin to redeploy them after a period of time? And I know we do that with red light cameras as we come back and we revisit them after a number of years and we find that habits have changed and you know the resource may be more valuable elsewhere. Uh, I wonder if you could offer some comment on that. Um, considering the signs are a bit costly and, and there's probably not enough to go around at this stage. Um, through you, Madam Chair, I uh, certainly, the pilot that we did initially was one year. And we've, we see that um, some of them we move around the neighborhoods, others are permanent as you describe. Uh, there's typically value there. We certainly uh, are attentive and paying um, regard to how those signs are affecting the challenge of speed reduction. And so we, we have moved them previously and could certainly move them again to make sure they're at their uh, peak of efficacy. Uh, I do also believe that once we get the authority confirmed to move forward with automated enforcement in school zones, that we would likely redeploy some of those signs as we would have other tools uh, deployed to be able to address speed in school zones. Great, thanks very much. Okay, I think that's all our question. Oh, Councillor Perutza. So, so I, I, I guess um, um, I, I wanna just sort of go back uh, a few years uh, and maybe my questions will be somewhat specific and I, I'm hoping that you'll be able to help me. Elia Middle School on Sentinel Road. Some years back, a young woman named Violet Liang got killed there on her first day of school. A truck making a turn ran her over and killed her. So we raised this whole uh, safety, school around safety zone issue, uh, brought motions forward, kicked up a fuss about it. I haven't noticed any change there other than a crossing guard at that school. So where is that school in your list of priorities? And what, you, what are you going to be doing there uh, to make sure that we don't have uh, that, um, uh, an accident like that ever again? Through you, Madam Chair, uh, if there is a fatality at a school and a tragedy of that nature at a school, it would, it would certainly be high on our list of schools. But understand, it happened uh, four, five years ago and nothing has happened there. How high does it have to get before something happens? Through you, uh, we actually look at five years previous of data to put that list together. We can certainly uh, find that specific school and let you know where that is on the list and what countermeasures we might propose for it. Uh, okay, but understand, understand where I'm coming from on this. So, so we had an accident there. Uh, the student got killed on the first day of school. Uh, we, we brought in a series of motions. It looked like something was going to happen. Uh, people were kind of like, you know, the boots were shuffling around. And four or five years later now, I, I can't remember the exact date, nothing has happened there. Like how long, did, how long uh, are, are we going to be at it before we actually do something? Through you, Madam. Chair, uh, I don't have the history there. We really, I would like to get you the history, so I would like to take a look at it and find out what was, um, what the conditions were, what was proposed. You mentioned there was just a school crossing guard added, but um, I would like to get back to you with more specific details that I don't have at the table right now. But, but you understand what I, where I I'm do, coming from? I absolutely understand where I, I you're don't, coming from. I don't from. mean to put you on the spot on, 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 on that, but I, I, I've seen like these reports uh, they, they've, we've, we've gotten um, a number of these reports and we've gotten a number of updates and we've got a number of people that have chatted about this, but actually in terms of actual physical changes on the ground and uh, in neighborhoods, uh, that, hasn't been, that hasn't happened, so. So part of, uh, through you, Madam uh, Chair, I'm having a little trouble with that today. Uh, through you, uh, the, the purpose of this report was to talk about uh, options for acceleration and while Vision Zero was approved in uh, June of 2016, I believe, it wasn't actually supposed to start uh, f rolling out until the beginning of this year in 2017. So we did move forward with some accelerations and reprioritization of resources to accelerate the program, some of which was adding this year accelerations to school zones. So you would start to see those rolling out more comprehensively moving forward. Um, I think it's never fast enough, but certainly we are gonna be uh, with a focus on that much more intense 
intently. I also wanted to just point out uh, we have a, a process moving forward now called a vulnerable users road safety assessment, which looks at the locations where events have occurred and identifies and, and use, builds that into our process moving forward. So that certainly we're being proactive about uh, addressing those issues. Yeah, so, so if somebody could, can, can get back to me on the Lyon Middle School, where that is and what you're going to be doing there, I, I, I really appreciate that. Okay, thank you. No? Okay. Um, let's move to speakers. Who would like to, I know Councillor Fletcher would like to speak on this. Oh, is that me now? Oh, thank you. I haven't seen what your motions are, but if they're to move things along, that would be fantastic. I think you're going to like them. Oh, good. I'm going to like that. Thank you. Um, I just want to uh, say how great it is, and again, thank uh, Ms. Gray and her staff for coming out. We had a great Vision Zero meeting out in my ward. People came, we had tables, we used maps, we identified where all the kind of most difficult, unsafe areas are, and now we're looking at following up, particularly around seniors, which are 82% of the fatalities, and also for school children. In, um, and I also look at the accelerations, the expansions, and the accelerations and expansions together and realize there's a number of those things that are kind of underway in the normal traffic operations budget that I'd like to make sure that we capture around our school zones without necessarily saying it was a Vision Zero project. So th what, I, what I want to do is figure out, now that we have Vision Zero and it's very robust, we also have tremendous amount of work that's been going on for many years in school zones. And when I was talking about the bollards on the uh, street, that's on Bain Avenue, a Withrow School. There's been bollards there for a long time. There was a community safety plan that has a pinch point there so people aren't barreling down the street. Uh, there are speed humps on that street that the, the community wanted. There um, are a number of things that don't fit right in our checklist for Vision Zero, but are actually, there's a school drop-off zone. Um, there are things there that we should recognize are very positive improvements for school zones. Um, for Earl Grey School, which I've mentioned, and I would like to follow up with staff and see how that came. Recently, uh, staff were very helpful in pinching and creating a shorter walking distance on the crosswalk against the ma major arterial that is at Jones Avenue. So that's already one of the things that's happened. I think some of these things that our community have been using for years because parents have been very, very strong advocates to have traffic slowed in their area, speed humps, turn prohibitions, crosswalk improvements, pavement markings, so that's on our side pick up and drop off zones, bump outs and bollards, I'd just like to see them get a little bit more of a formal recognition of optional pieces as far as Vision Zero is concerned. I do happen to know about all of those. There might be schools somewhere where they don't have that on a list. They're just going with those countermeasures because Vision Zero, as I understand it, is a pretty high level um, application through uh, program that we're adopting here in the city, but I think it's really helpful to adopt some of the things that we've been using for decades and decades as part of our school improvement and school safety zones into our template Vision Zero, which I understand we're, I don't want to say we're buying a product, but it is, a, it's a trademark, Vision Zero, but we have a lot of things that we need to add in ourselves, and I don't know b the best way to do that. I may move something like that they, at they council. Um, and I just want to thank all the staff for all of their great work when we raise school issues. And um, I think that Vision Zero in particular has brought thinking about kids going to school back up to the foreground. We used to have walking school buses. We used to have the Active Transportation Coalition. We had many things that Board of Health has often dealt with these things. But this puts it all in one place. If we need to do anything more, it's just make it a little more robust and put a Toronto stamp on it that we have other things that we can use and we do use in our city that promote safety for seniors and for, um, for students. 
Thank you. Uh, Councillor Nunziata. Yes, uh, thank you, and uh, thank you to staff for the report. Um, I'm just hoping that this report, the Vision Zero, gets, gets communicated to the community council districts, because I think it's really important that the staff that are working out of East York, Scarborough, that when there's requests ma made for these, you know, for these issues that are in the report, um, that we don't get a response saying, oh, it doesn't meet the warrant, no, no. Because everything I get, it never meets the warrants. Um, and we're always putting the res these requests forward. Um, years ago, I remember years ago, uh, we, we used to have the community safety zones which we implemented at council. Do you remember that, yeah. councillor? Yeah. yeah, in certain areas, and we had signs posted up, community safety zones, and we put them, I put them on Scarlet, and actually the police were out there enforcing it, and the fines were doubled. I think they were doubled or tripled at the time, and that really slowed down the traffic. I don't know what's happening with that program, if they're actually still doing what they were supposed to do, but that made a difference as well. Um, and there were different parts of the city that were, um, that were implemented, uh, the, the zones. Um, and also, too, the police slow down signs, I mean, the slow down, uh, you know, the, yeah, that shows your speed. I thought, and at one point, I thought it was, that, that was uh, from police services, that if you asked the police services to put them up, they'd put them up. I don't know if they still have them, but I always thought, yeah, I, I, th I think they used to have those mobile. They only have two? In the whole city? Well, I don't know. But I mean, that used to be police services. I used to put those signs up. Um, so I don't know what's happening with that. But, um, you know, some of the, you know, like I think we need to work closely with our with our staff and, and the community. If, and if there's requests coming forward that are legitimate requests, like we have to act on it. You know, we, we can't always say it doesn't meet warrants because, you know, we wait, and then then suddenly someone's killed, and then everybody reacts to it. We shouldn't be, we should be proactive, not reactive. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just want to ask the committee for one minute, if I could just stray from the the order, because I wanted to ask a quick question to staff. Is that okay? Because I think Roger Brown got off easy, so I want to ask him a question, and he is the lead on this initiative. Don't you agree? He should have to get. Show us his stuff. And Hamish is back in the room. So, um, Roger, Hamish talked about committees being struck, but we've got a big, great committee working on this, uh, a stakeholder group that's ginormous and meets somewhat regularly. Can you just uh, share with the committee and our visiting councillors and our guests here today what we put in place based on motions that we moved long ago? Thank you, yeah, to the Chair. Um, so dating back to when we actually started developing the road safety plan, there's about 12 different organizations and about 24 representatives in total from a number of groups, uh, Cycle Toronto, Walk Toronto, CAA, um, CARP, um, a lot of different groups within the City of Toronto that basically collaborated in the development of the road safety plan itself. And then through the council motion, and even within that group, uh, we came to the realization that it was very important for us to continue meeting and continue working on the plan and developing and evolving that plan through the process. So subsequently, we created the Road Safety Committee. Um, we've had a meeting so far this year. Our plan is to meet um, twice a year with respect to this. And, and, uh, and in, fact, in terms of our plans next year, we're going to be working and collaborating with everybody in terms of coming up with new ideas and new concepts to, uh, to supplement the road safety plan moving forward. Okay, so you've got a road safety committee that helped really f uh, formulated, played a role in formulating this whole plan, and you continue to meet uh, when needed to discuss the issues. Through the chair, yeah, that's correct, yeah. As well, on top of that, we have also, my understanding is, because I chair it, um, an annual summit. Do you want to uh, elaborate on that a bit? And it, so the, the Road Safety Committee primarily consists of a number of groups that, uh, that basically are involved in actually delivering on the road safety plan. So in other words, like Toronto Police, Toronto Public Health, um, the school boards are all involved. It's, it's, it's groups like that that are basically within the Road Safety Committee. However, there's a number of organizations that are greatly affected by 
uh, the changes, the improvements that we make in terms of the road safety plan. And this is where we have our annual Vision Zero Summit that actually, Councillor uh, Robinson, or Chair Robinson, rather you chair, um, where once a year we basically have that stakeholder consultation as well too that gives an opportunity for those groups to come in and have a voice and be heard with, uh, from my staff as well for ideas we could take into consideration. So we've got both the Vision Zero Summit, which happens once a year, and we've got the Road Safety Committee that meets as well regularly uh, in terms of helping to develop and provide input to the plan. Excellent answer. Thank you for that. You can go home. Take the rest of the day off. Barbara said so. Okay, so um, I'm actually, if all, uh, did Councillor Davis leave? Did you want to, did you want to ask, or did you want to speak? Because we're finishing, we're just wrapping up. I do, and I have a motion that's not written yet. Okay, well, you can't move a motion, so. Oh, we're going to all get some motion. Anthony will move my motion. I think we're already doing this. Won't you answer? I'm not sure. <laughs> So we're, we've actually done all our speakers. We're moving into committee. If you'd like to speak now. You've done all your speakers? Yeah, we just did We just strayed a bit to go back to questions. So, counts, no, no, no. Councillor Fletcher, our visiting councillors have spoken. So this, this is your moment. Otherwise, we're moving into committee. Okay. I have a motion. Okay. That requests the city manager to expedite the development of the IT solution and business case for the alternative penalty system and advance it con to, for consideration through the 2018 budget process. It's not exactly what I wrote, but it's probably close. Um, and the reason I ask this, uh, and, it, and it is in relation to uh, the questions I asked, what is before us is a request to proceed with um, an APS, to develop an APS system. Is there a request? There is a request. To request to undertake an investigation into the feasibility of adopting a penalty system, and I'm suggesting that we go further than that. There have been um, there are a number of reasons why we want an alternative penalty system. We have now successfully introduced it for tickets, and it has allowed us to expedite the resolution of thousands, hundreds of thousands of tickets. Um, it is a new authority and a new. Uh, ability for us to introduce penalties through an administrative system as opposed to going through the backed up courts um, that we have, even though we administer them, have very little control over in terms of the appointment of, G of uh, JPs and anyway, it allows us to uh, actually manage um, a penalty system. It is supposed to be something we deal with in uh, March of 2018, I believe, for our new apartment building uh, bylaw, which we want to be able to introduce new penalties uh, through that system and uh, apply the new APS system uh, there as well. So this just asks us if we can expedite it. It's under development. If we don't do this for 2018, we won't see this until 2021. Because by the time it's developed, uh, it goes through a budget process in 2019, and then 2020 it will start to be developed, won't be implemented till 2021. So let's not delay another full year on this. Um, now, other than that, I should focus on what's before us, <laughs> which is expediting the, um, uh, the Vision Zero safety plan. And I understand there's going to be a motion to expedite it. We had a very good discussion and a good presentation at the school board's advisory city school board's advisory committee on this, and there is just a huge pent up and unmet demand for improving road safety around schools and right across our city. So, um, if we can in any way expedite it, the school zones alone at ten a year, as we pointed out, is going to take thirty five years or. Um, however many it was, uh, however many years uh, to actually implement, we need to do that faster. Um, and the other uh, suggesting, I, I, I'm sorry, Councillor Carmichael, grab, but 
I just think giving neighborhoods the ability to pay for their community safety uh, through fundraising in their wealthier neighborhoods is just not fair. And um, I know there'll be people who will argue, well, if we can pay for it ourselves, that leaves more money for those who can't. We've heard those arguments many, many times uh, on all kinds of services. And I just think every neighborhood should be treated the same. And it's based on a set of criteria for who's going to get uh, priority. And I think that's the way that the safety plan should be, should be dealt with, including the watcher speed um, indicators. Finally, um, one of the things that concerns me, and I've had some communication with transportation staff, is the budget assigned to signals. Um, the budget assigned to signals for 2017, and I think in every previous year, uh, the demand has exceeded the budget. Uh, this year alone, we have 11, at least 11 signals that are unfunded for 2017. And uh, I think the transportation budget for 2017 needs to be adjusted so that we increase the amount allocated for signals. I have a signal on an intersection where there was a death this year and the community is expecting a signal. Um, but there are already 11 signals waiting. So we need to, we did one year increase the amount of money for uh, traffic signals and I think we need to do it again this year and that's what I intend to do in the budget process. Okay. And uh, I hope that there will be a way that we can achieve that. Otherwise, if the budget caps all this stuff, then we're not gonna actually be able to deliver on many of these initiatives. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to speak first um, as we move into committee just because I have a number of motions and I want you to be aware of those right off the top. Um, the number, uh, number one thing I'll say is that I'm going to move Councillor Davis's motion, which if the clerk could put that on the screen, and then we'll move to the other motions. So she described it. Um, is it coming up? Uh, Councillor Davis has already described what she's looking for. It's kind of somewhat related to recommendation three on page two of the report, uh, but I'm going to move on into the, my motion. So my motions are uh, related to the budget committee. And that is to try to accelerate this and expand it. Um, and then I'm moving recommendation two and three in the staff report and I'll get into a bit more detail in a minute. And then with motion B, if you could put that on the screen, um, that's simply to, on, on recommendation two, I'd like to amend this to, to also st say, um, I, I don't know why it's not underlined. So s committee could see what the amendment was. Oh, okay. Okay, so then I'll just speak to the amendment. Um, on this, which is an opportunity for partnership with the province and the school board. So those are the motions. Um, I just want to uh, start by thanking, again, it's the Miles Curry Day, but uh, I want to thank Miles for his work on this, his leadership on Vision Zero, and of course Roger, Roger Brown, who's really hit, hit the ground running from the get-go, from the beginning, and uh, has a great deal of enthusiasm and energy and passion for this uh, this issue, this initiative that we've started in Toronto. So um, thank you, Miles and Roger, for your great work on this. And of course, our, our leader in, in um, transportation, Barbara Gray. I also want to take a moment just to thank the police because we have an unprecedented relationship now with the police on, these, on this initiative. I can't say we had that prior to Council adopting Vision Zero, our, rates, our road safety plan for Toronto, but now we're meeting with them regularly, we're working with them hand in hand. Again, I can't say enough about that relationship and how it's evolved. Uh, largely because of, of Vision Zero. So that's been a really good news story. Um, related to my motions, uh, I would like to ask the Budget Committee, uh, I'd like this committee to ask Budget Committee to uh, consider and make recommendations on the funding required to implement the further acceleration and expansion of the road safety plan in 2018 rather than 2019. So the, the recommendations you see before you are 2019. I don't think any of us feel that's good enough. 
I think most councillors agree that we need to find ways to always accelerate and expand this plan, and uh, that is requesting budget committee, as is the proper process, to do just that, to revisit this and uh, look at whether we can move this into 2018. Uh, certainly, without a doubt, the city's committed to Vision Zero. It's our, our fundamental message, fatalities and serious injuries. Uh, on our roads are preventable and we must strive to reduce traffic related deaths and injuries to zero. That is our goal. We're committed to it. And, um, you know, while in 2017, if you look at the, the report that Council adopted on this, it was the official year of the plan, staff actually fast tracked a significant amount of work in the fall of 2016. So we've accelerated Vision Zero in 2016. We've accelerated it in 2017, as the, the report beautifully articulates, and we're going to continue to do this uh, without a doubt. So this report really brings forward opportunities for further acceleration and expansion to City Council, our City Council-approved Vision Zero Road Safety Plan. And I'm, I've got a few minutes here, so I'm going to just tell, I'm going to talk about what we've accelerated. We've accelerated the new uh, senior strategy the advanced green for pedestrians, school watch your speed program, school traveling planning, active and safe routes to school, uh, reduced crossing distance with curb extensions, expansions to existing measures, uh, we include the uh, automated enforcement, advocacy and pilot, education and awareness initiatives, mobile watch your speed program, new community donations program, which we've talked a little bit about today, and measures that we will continue to accelerate and expand are the pavement markings, school zones, and enhancements and road safety audits at high risk locations. So that and much more, because as the staff I think have done a really good job of providing us with a, a comprehensive update and really letting council know that we have been accelerating this since day one. We, we're taking this very seriously. Uh, these, these are tragedies on our street and we have to do everything as a city council we can to, to stop this. Um, and, you know, uh, we are doing a little better, but it's never good enough. And so we can have to con remain vigilant, stay focused, and continue to push this through the, the budget process. So again, I want to just summarize by thanking staff, thanking them for this great report that really emphasizes the hard work that's taken place. Um, we want to keep our staff's morale up and, and thank them for the work they've done. I, I, I find it a little bit frustrating uh, when city councillors don't read the reports, don't look at the strategy, don't look at the timelines, and don't appreciate the fact that staff have done everything they can, um, pulled rabbits out of the hat to accelerate Vision Zero in this city, which is such an important initiative. So um, I don't think that's right when people mislead uh, the public to say we, we're not moving fast enough because we're moving as fast as we can. We've redoubled our efforts and we're going to continue to do that. So those are my motions. I hope you'll support them. Um, they're, I think they're good, solid motions and they take this, this plan in the right direction. Other speakers on this item? Absolutely, you cannot, but you can ask somebody else to. You have to be on committee. Whisper it to Councillor Lee. <laughs> I love the face. He's frozen. Okay, any other um, remarks on this item? Okay, so let's go through the motions. Uh, we'll do, who sh who, what, what happens first? So Councillor Davis's is first. I'm moving it on her behalf. This is to expedite the, uh, it's really, really related to item three, recommendation three. It's just a little bit of a modification of that. So all those in favor? That is approved and that's carried. Item two, um, I'm sorry, motion A is before us and that is to accelerate 
further accelerate an expansion of the road safety plan into 2018 and we're asking budget committee to look at that versus 2019. All those in favor carried that goes forward on to budget committee and then the last motion is one and two moving those with um, the, the amendment below which again I didn't really uh, explain this very well but this is to the addition here is the opportunity for partnership with the province and school boards to work collaboratively with them. I think they need to play a role in all this around the school's safety zones particularly. All those in favor? Carried. Um, and okay. sorry? That's it. Nothing else. I don't, I'm done. Okay. We're going to move on to our next item. And we're at 11.30, so we should be able to complete the agenda before, um, before lunch. PW 25.11. It's uh, Councillor Holiday held this one. It's Business Improvement Area Consultation on Green Street's technical guidelines. Oh, and you, we've got a good suggestion from our, our clerk to just step back uh, to the motion that we were talking about related to the um, third green bin organics processing facility. Emily will not leave till we move this. She said so. She's stomping her feet. So um, this is the motion we talked about in a loosey-goosey way. Counsel, our, uh, Deputy, I almost called you a councillor. Deputy City Manager John Levy has uh, drafted this for us um, to send a bit of a message that we want to try to get this moving forward. So uh, are people comfortable with this motion? All in favour? That is carried. So that item is now done and now we only have three items left including the one we just started, number 11. So Councillor Holiday. Questions, Questions for uh, uh, staff? Thank you Madam Chair. Um, Thank you to staff for the report. If I can paraphrase what it says, it says that business improvement area associations aren't necessarily going to be asked to fund or maintain uh, some of the green infrastructure improvements that had been previously considered by committee. And if I've got that correct. Do you, Madam Chair, correct. There, there isn't uh, a change in terms of how, uh, if a BIA was interested in moving forward with green streets, they would work in partnership with the city in the same way they would do for any other type of frontage improvement and the maintenance would be the same. So they would not be required, uh, I think was the, was the question that was asked of us, uh, what would that relationship be? Would they be required to move forward with green streets improvements? And the answer is no, they would not be required. So the report talks about um, Municipal Code Chapter 743 and I bring our attention to subsections 36 and 37 that talks about property owner responsibility and municipal responsibilities. I'd asked about it at committee at the time but I'll, for example, I'll hold up a picture from the, from the report from October that just shows a really nice lush street with uh, lots of plantings, lots of trees and, and, and lots of improvements. I wanted to be really clear on this because I think this is important about who maintains that. I know in the suburbs, the community that I live in, we're governed by article, uh, sorry, subsection 36 of property owner responsibilities. We've got to cut the grass and by extend to, you know, 20 centimeters, um, we, or we can get ticketed. Um, we've got to maintain natural gardens to a certain height so that the sight lines are looked at. Um, Subsection 36 part F says we have to prune trees, trim hedges, shrubs and soft landscaping uh, to maintain vertical clearance and so on. But I am a little bit confused as I read on into subsection 37 that talks about um, street trees, hedges, shrubs, maintain natural gardens planted by the city. I wanted to know which of the sections we're, we're governing this. In other words, who is going to be maintaining all of these plantings? Is it going to be the property owners that abut these or is it going to be the city? And if it's the city, how do we plan on being able to do that? Through you, Madam Chair, the, um, the nature and uh, scope of those Green Street improvements would be something that we would want to work carefully with communities before we move forward. In some cases, we have uh, improvements in the boulevard and in the, in the public right-of-way that uh, require a higher level of maintenance. We typically don't put those in unless there's a, an agreement uh, to have those maintained, whether that's through an agreement with the BIA or with an adjacent property owner. Uh, as far as the trees go, and, and I 
think, because Green Streets is a relatively new program, we're really just ro rolling out a pilot right now, and we are in conversations with uh, Toronto Water and City Planning uh, to come up with sort of very specific maintenance uh, um, schedules and uh, implementation measures for the city's infrastructure. But green infrastructure is typically in not only for aesthetic reasons, but also as a drainage function, and so uh, that those components would be largely managed and maintained by the city if it was above and beyond uh, that um, the, the community or the BIA wanted to add, then that would be something we would, we would discuss with them as to what the maintenance responsibilities would be. Okay. But we would not require. I, I think I understood that, uh, especially the, the harder parts of the soft infrastructure relating to drainage I get is a city function because ultimately it speaks to water drainage, which is something we do through Toronto Water. But um, would I be um, inferring correctly that there is no base assumption that the city is suddenly going to take on the cost of looking after in totality one of these things, but we would be looking at partnerships and, and having responsibility shared between those that may be benefiting by living right in front of this or, or having a business in front of this? Through you, that's correct. And uh, we are doing pilot projects in 2018 in partnership with our environmental construction, engineering construction services in Toronto Water in order to flesh out a lot of these issues more specifically. And would I, would I also be correct in inferring that uh, staff would consider some notion of equity between the suburbs and the urban parts of the city that, you know, a lot of people put a lot of effort into taking care of the city's properties that are near their home or their business. Uh, out in the suburbs because they have to and it, it makes a lot of sense and they've always done that um, but we would be treating things equitably in the more urban parts to say if the city is going to be improving this beyond a slab of concrete we hope you'll help by keeping it clean and and, and doing your part through you I, I yes I would think so excellent Th thank you very much for answering my questions I have none further madam chair Davis um, Beyond, how many pilot projects are expected in 2018? Two new ones. Through you, there are two new pilot projects in Etobicoke. And Raindrop, Plaza. Raindrop Plaza has been uh, implemented this year. Uh, we're doing some uh, green infrastructure improvements on Riverside Drive. And military trailism consideration to improve the drainage. And we're also considering military trail to improve the drainage component. So about, our, five, about five projects. So the original proposal was to use green infrastructure as part of our regular construction projects. Are we moving in that direction other than just doing um, pilot projects through you part of the purpose of the pilot project is to figure out the standards and the design guidance and the maintenance implications of implementing green infrastructure whether it's part of a basement flooding program or part of a local road resurfacing program or other and so the intent is to do the pilots in 2018 and assess them uh, and continue to work with our partners in engineering construction services on the standards to build those in where it makes sense to do so. So well, that is a function, the pilots are a function of moving towards a more repeatable process. So it's taken three years to develop the standards before we finally seen them. The standards are now finished. I assume that we're doing more than just testing them. Otherwise, I can see we're going to be doing the same thing in 2020 where we go in to do a road project and we replace asphalt boulevards with asphalt boulevards, which I think is just a shame when there are plenty of opportunities for greening our infrastructure through our regular capital projects in the right of way, and that was the intent. Are we going to do that soon? So this year. Through you, the, um, the guidelines that we brought forward to committee just recently and approved were, not, were actually not construction standards. So there's a, a different level of um, detail that's required in, in construction standards and specifications for installing these. So the first step was to put the guidelines forward. I can't really speak to the time frame of, of how long that took to do. Um, we are also looking in terms of implementation to our five-year uh, construction plan and looking at how we can integrate and find the right 
uh, locations, because Toronto Water has an excellent map that identifies the locations where green infrastructure has the most uh, likelihood of being successful, and so we're trying to marry up through our coordination programs, our resurfacing program with those locations and basement flooding programs to try to get the best outcome for the least dollars. And you have an implementation report coming anyway in the new year, I just remember. We do. In March, I believe. That will help summarize these issues. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, that's it for questions. We're moving to speakers. Councillor Davis. I just, I think the program that is now going to look at ways to improve the permeability of the public spaces in our city has, we've been, we're, we're way behind other cities. So I, I, I'm glad we're moving forward with it. The BIAs also want to beautify their streets. And so there is a partnership that is um, available to them if they would like to participate in it. I think we do need to uh, kind of dot, dot the I's and cross the T's on the kind of agreements that need to be in place um, with the BIAs around the various pieces of infrastructure, whether they are tree pits, <laughs> Uh, whether it is um, uh, uh, um, uh, permeable paving, uh, all of the features that we usually put into this kind of new green infrastructure, uh, and which division is responsible for maintaining the trees, the tree fences, where there are tree fences. Um, and so I understand that figuring out who's responsible for maintaining is a really important piece and still needs to be hammered out. Uh, and I hope it gets hammered out very quickly. Thank you. Thank you. And all those in favor? That's carried. Let's move to our next item, which is item 12. Oh, I'm sorry, that was a receipt for information. So it's I guess, adopt, yeah. Oh, it is adopt? Okay, so adopt recommendations, we've done that. So we're gonna to move to our next item, and we've got a, a very short presentation that staff have worked very hard to prepare for us, so they're gonna get in place. This item is PW 25.12, it's curbside management strategy, and um, I guess our team can take it away. We do not have speakers on it. Thank you. Uh, while we get queued up here on the technology, um, I appreciate the opportunity to just give some overview on this uh, curbside management strategy. Um, it's a little bit jargony, so I just wanted to clarify, we're talking about a comprehensive approach to prioritizing the use of the curb space. Curb space, uh, the area uh, of the street next to the curb is increasingly in demand. Um, it's always been uh, you know, used by parkers, by people who are loading and doing delivery. Um, certainly by uh, sometimes by uh, uh, transit lanes or cycle lanes, but the demands on curb space uh, with pickups and drop-offs have gotten increasingly more intense, and so we have been asked to take a more comprehensive look at how we can uh, apply some better thinking and more comprehensive thinking to the use of the curb space. So I'm going to first. Uh, talk about that and really give a high level overview of the principles and policies and what uh, what this plan uh, puts forward. So first off, the study area boundary is not the entire city. We've meant, uh, matched it to the limits that were identified in the downtown transportation operations study that was carried out in 2012 and 2013. And you can see on the screen there, it's, uh, it's uh, in the downtown area. We do think, however, that some of the solutions and tactics have broader applicability uh, citywide. And so uh, we we continue to look at what we've learned here and figure out how to apply that elsewhere. Um, we had a couple of goals going into this. The first stuff, this, this curbside management strategy actually comes out of the congestion management plan. How can we get the most utility and function out of our existing uh, city streets and rights of way? Um, we want to be able to manage congestion more effectively. We want to ensure that our curbside activity supports economic activity. And we want to meet the needs of our stakeholders for various curbside functions, both public and private, uh, residential and commercial. And so we also recognize that different streets have typically different land uses and they have different functions and so we've aligned our plans and policies accordingly. Um, and this uh, plan has um 
has also a number of, um, it has some policies involved. It, ha it has an implementation plan with uh, immediate quick wins, near and longer term solutions. So I'll go over that quickly as well. Uh, we looked at a couple of main things. First of all, we looked at existing and future conditions within the study area. We looked at best practices from over 20 cities, and um, I want to just highlight those that we felt were really relevant for the city of Toronto. Uh, one was around accessible parking, courier delivery and goods movement, on-street parking and availability, signage, TV and film, and integration of, of best practices. So we, we did a, a deep dive in, of, of in cities in North America, but we really focused on some critical issues for Toronto. And then uh, we also did a fair amount of stakeholder engagement um, including uh, many, many meetings, but uh, a, a core group of stakeholders, including some of the councillors, including uh, you, Chair Robinson, uh, the Disability Access and Inclusion Advisory Committee, Cycle Toronto, the local BIAs, the Canadian Automobile Association, Canadian Courier and Logistics Association, the Ontario Trucking Association, the Ontario Motor Coach Association, Toronto Police, Fire and Paramedics, the TTC, the Toronto Parking Authority, the Toronto Film and Television Office, City planning, our TO core team, our municipal licensing and standards group, uh, especially related to the taxis uh, and vehicle for hire, as well as representatives from the taxi and vehicle for hire industry, and armored truck and shredding services. And I know that's kind of a long list, but I wanted just to, to point out that there's a lot of stakeholders when you're talking about modifying or changing the curb space. And so we really tried to do an upfront and comprehensive job at reaching out to identify what their needs and concerns were. And so through that, we've identified some tactics that I'm going to go over now. Now. Um, our principles. The first is that mobility matters, uh, and the curbside has a, an impact on uh, the management of congestion, uh, as well as support of the adjacent land uses and the support of surface transit. Um, we looked at reducing curbside use at peak periods. Uh, we looked at encouraging off-street curbside use. So how could we sort of get the best utility out of uh, not just the street we're looking at, but the adjacent streets as well. Uh, another principle was safe and reliable access, uh, recognizing again, consistent with our Vision Zero report that we just described, that road user safety is paramount. And, uh, and also recognizing uh, that the right-of-way serves many different functions uh, during the course of the day and based on uh, the activities that are occurring. And then we wanted to communicate how valuable the humble curbside is. It really is not something that people, I think, um, think much about unless it doesn't uh, particularly work well for them. But um, it's, it's reasonable to have some simple solutions that, that get to great effect. Uh, we know it's a scarce resource and in higher demand all the time, uh, and that we have to manage that resource in the same way we man manage other resources we do already right now in terms of parking with fees, um, and where appropriate, we, we've made some recommendations related to that as well. Um, and that we need to be both transparent and accountable with regard to how decisions get made about the curbside. So uh, the first was to look at the roles that the curbside plays. This is a, a, a process that's been articulated in a couple of other cities as well as with some uh, North American organizations uh, focusing on movement, access for business, access for people, parking and activation, and that all curbside plays a role in, in promoting or diminishing all of these activities, and depending on the adjacent land use and the use of the street, uh, you want to emphasize some over the others. The other piece uh, that we did in this strategy was to identify uh, a hierarchy of functions by type. So we looked at our street types, which, uh, and we, we com combined some of those together, but we looked at them as part of our complete streets approach, uh, identified those corridors that prioritize movement in the city versus access, so movement on one side of the, of the scale through movement, arterial roadways, uh, versus those where the access and loading needs are, are more significant. And uh, we prioritized all the streets in the study area according to that. Um, we have some categories here, those streets that we have surface transit priority, the common arterial, uh, those that have a cycling priority in the 10-year cycling plan and create that connectivity. And then uh, the access, on the access side, uh, looking at both mixed use access, so streets that have um, access to adjacent businesses, commercial and residential properties, and then uh, what we call mixed use main street, where they support a wide variety of adjacent ground level uses and commercial, commercial uses. 
Okay, I'm gonna go quickly over some of the quick wins. These are things we can do right away, or in some cases, the first three we're actually bringing to the Toronto East York Community Council in January. The first is to undertake a pilot in partnership uh, with uh, the taxis, but also with our, uh, in, 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 um, with, a, with the uh, concurrence of our uh, fire services, to uh, look at allowing taxi waiting areas at some fire hydrants in the study area. It's not everyone, it's some of them. They have to actually uh, be uh, with their vehicle when they're waiting in these areas, but it does help facilitate taxi patron drop-off uh, on some of our busier corridors. Um, the second is to formally regulate existing advisory courier loans, so the courier load zones, so making those from advisory to designated so that we have an actual, carving out an actual delivery vehicle parking location on the curbside. Um, and the last is formerly, formally regulating existing advisory motorcycle and scooter parking areas. So previously, we were with the advent of uh, pay and display and the, uh, the Toronto Parking Authority app, uh, we now have the ability to um, regulate motorcycle and scooter parking areas, whereas we did not before. So that's a quick win in the, in the plan. Um, also, uh, solving some long-standing problems, this one in partnership with the Financial District BIA, looking at how we can better control uh, some unique loading circumstances they have that impact the curb. Uh, First Canadian Place in Scotia Plaza have loading elevators, and we often have conflicts with the trucks that are waiting to get on those elevators and the other users of the roadway, especially uh, the cycle facility there. And then looking at more automated parking enforcement methods, including seeking authority from the province for automated enforcement, we're doing that uh, as part of our Vision Zero work as well. Uh, the short-term action, zero to two years, uh, would support the expanded use of off-peak deliveries. So we did this, I believe, in the 2015 Pan Am Games, looked at uh, focusing on off-peak delivery for, uh, for certain types of businesses. Other cities have done this. We actually um, had a fair, fairly lengthy conversation with the City of New York because they do this quite extensively, and they, uh, they've been doing it for some time, so they have some good lessons learned about where they feel they've gone too far and the feedback they've gotten from their state stakeholders, and we've had a lot of robust conversation with our stakeholders as well about how to make that work. Um, sign legibility was brought up. The signs uh, regulate the curbside use, and so they can be extremely confusing, and we also have looked to some other cities who have simplified their advisory signage, uh, not the regulatory so much, but the advisory signage, and so we have that as a short-term win, or sorry, as a short-term action. Uh, providing more supportive information to couriers and other service delivery vehicles to guide where and where not to park. So because there are so many different uses of the curb space, it can be very confusing. And so not just relying on the signs to be able to direct that activity, but doing some more outreach uh, to the courier and service delivery industry. Um, implementing messaging that communicates alternative off-street parking locations and rates. So really helping people try to find locations to park within the vicinity of where they might be looking so we can get them to their parking space as quickly as, as, uh, as we can. And then they don't have to circle the block. And then uh, continued on, improving communications, monitoring enforcement of motor coach parking and load zones. We tested some of this out with the, um, the ROM this year with the Bloor Street bike lanes, but more uh, working with the motor coaches to try to get those places to be um, identified and then, uh, and then uh, monitored and enforced. Um, exploring changes to commercial laneways to support off-street loading and deliveries in key areas, and we've been partnering with the Downtown Young BIA on this, uh, this short-term activity to improve effectiveness of the laneways for loading and deliveries. And then continuing to explore concerns related to the enforcement and use of accessible permits. Uh, that's a conversation that we uh, are going to continue to have with the province and also uh, with police services. Uh, about managing those curbside needs, which are very important for the accessibility community, but we want to ensure that um, that's done in balance um, with other curbside uses. And then uh, we are also kicking off, and we brought to this committee, I believe last, last session, a freight and goods movement strategy that uh, will look at access uh, for freight and goods movement within the city. And then a little bit longer, the medium term wins, uh, looking at a courier delivery vehicle permit system, looking at variable pricing options, uh, both for parking and other uses, 
rationalizing or introducing new designated motor coach pickup and drop off and parking zones located in high demand areas, and then uh, rationalizing and introducing new taxi cab stands where necessary. And then uh, finally, uh, advancing automated parking enforcement methods. So again, as Councilor Robinson said, the technology is coming fast and furious, and so we've tried to build in here the opportunity to go back, uh, test some things out, uh, put some things in place, and then come back and modify them uh, as necessary. Okay, that is our short and hopefully informative presentation. Uh, we do have a question for you from Councillor Davis. I see it includes the City Hall property in the zone, the pilot zone. Is that correct? Through you, yes, it does. So are you going to be dealing with uh, the illegal limousine and Uber Black pickups that continue on the east side of City Hall? Mm -hmm. We'll certainly be looking at the curb space around in this study area. I, do you have any um, specific you, proposals? Maybe my question is, could yes. you please look at that? Every morning this morning, there were six limousines parked illegally waiting for clients from the Bell Build and Hydro Building across the way. Through you, we're Every happy, single happy to look at that. morning. That's a question, do, please. That was the question. Are you going to be looking at that? Santa Monica, comment. Great. Okay. Happy to look. Um, oh, other right, Councillor Hall. Oh, okay. TTC has TTC been involved? Through you, yes, TTC has okay. been involved. Okay. Councillor Holiday. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just want to go to slide eight. I wonder if we could back up to that. So something intrigued me here. Um, there, there is, seems to be sort of two buckets: mobility matters and access matters. And I know the report talks a lot about mobility mattering. Who? puts a street into the bucket of access matters. And I'll draw your attention to the first one right there, Young Street all day. Who sets that policy? Well, in, in, in terms of access matters, but we're, we're trying to uh, service the needs of residents that are trying to access their homes or their, their facilities. Uh, we have a lot of Main Street type of functions as well that service businesses at, at, at the ground level and, and commercial uh, institutions. Uh, so these things could vary over time, and, and it could vary from quarter to quarter. This is kind of a snapshot, but again, across the city, the functions could change on a block-by-block -block basis and on a quarter basis as well. This is just one scenario that's being presented here, but we're, we're looking, at, at looking at this through uh, this particular lens, both mobility and access. Okay, so it's not, it's not at the council level. So council's not saying Young Street is going to be an access matter street. And the reason I, I say this is very important because if I look at the definition of mixed use main street, access for people, activation, parking, access for, and then movements at the bottom. So my read of this says um, we're going to introduce parking along Young Street because it's, it's, it's a higher up on the hierarchy. And I think that's an important public policy question. I just want to be clear about where that policy is being set. So through you, thank you for the question. The, uh, it's similar to our quick wins that I said we were bringing back the first three to Toronto East York Community Council. Any specific actions or changes that were resulting of this strategy that modified any of the uses on the street would come back to council as a separate proposal to the appropriate committee? Okay, I mean, another example of that, if I've got it clear, is um, because parking is put above and access for people is put above movement, that would also mean that there's no way you could put a bike lane on Young Street. Is that true? According to this model, because a movement fall, bike lanes is somewhere else in this report defines bicycles and cars and everything together as movement. Uh, through you, the, so we, we identified mobility as those uh, activities were, that go through on the right of way. So that would be transit and cars and cycling facilities. Okay. so so. Would I be correct in saying that these are kind of empirical models or ways at looking things, but it's not necessarily hard and fast that correct that, that we don't we don't say okay this street or this section or whatever is suddenly an access matter section and we take the model that we have today and turn it upside down, which is essentially the list is, is now backwards right from movement matters. 
Through you, the, the intention here is to create a framework by which we can be a make a little bit more rational decision making based on the use and demands placed on the curb space in a block by block basis. Some of the challenges as you probably know we have in transportation is that on the mobility side as a network based system, yep. you, you don't just can't just deal with all of the mobility issues in a block by block basis because transit routes go through and major corridors go through uh, and cycling facilities go through as well. But they get they come into conflict with the very important demands at the curbside that service the adjacent businesses and, and blocks. And so this is trying to identify based on how the curb and the cor how the corridor is used and what the adjacent land uses are, how we would set a framework for making decisions about those streets. Okay. Those decisions would come in the form of specific recommendations back to council based on where they were. So if we were going to bring recommendations back on like a Young Street, we'd bring it back to council. Would it, would, let's say Young Street is a great example. Would it come back as a package then to say, you know, we recommend this whole trance of changes. It could be as simple as, you know, changing parking hours and no stopping signs to lanes and infrastructure, sidewalk width. You know, th there's a lot to that, but is this kind of setting things up for projects? Through you, I, it, could, it could happen at the large scale through an EA process influencing that. It could happen at a block by block basis through parking regulations. I think it just depends on the improvement that's being, uh, that's being recommended. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Carmichael Grubb is next. Um, just a quick question. On the um, off-peak deliveries, do you consult with BIAs and other businesses outside of the study area, will, or will you be? I know, just as an example, during the Pan Am Games, businesses in my ward were affected because um, companies had shifted all of their deliveries to overnight. So for a small business, where there's one or two people that work in a store um, and then they now have to work overnight and all day because the business, the, the deliveries are coming overnight. Do you look at that as well? Through you, I think that's an excellent example. In fact, the many of the learnings we've made about the deliveries to uh, small businesses as opposed to some of the larger businesses um, are that they are um, not equipped uh, in, in many cases to be able to receive overnight deliveries. And I think it's also one of the lessons that we learned uh, in reaching out to the city of New York is that they were able to move forward with overnight deliveries aggressively in some areas, and it really made a lot of sense. In others, they had to be a little bit more nuanced in how they rolled that out. But I think what we've learned in looking in this study area, some of those pieces could absolutely be applied citywide. Okay, I don't see any more questions. Thank you for your presentation, all of you. and. Uh, for your good work on this report. We're gonna to move to speakers. Councillor Nunziata, do you wanna speak on this item? Because if not, we're gonna move into committee. You're okay. Okay, we're gonna move into committee. Um, so I don't know if anybody would, I'd like to say a few words, but anybody else? No? Okay, then I'll just. Councillor Peruzza, are you? Oh, that's a different issue. Um, okay, so I'll just be very brief and say thank you to staff for this report. Again, uh, you know, congestion and gridlock are a, a big issue in our city. I certainly, like you, hear about it from my residents continually, as I said earlier. And um, I think that this, if you look at this agenda, it really speaks to the, the scale and scope and sheer volume of work that transportation is doing. Um, and it's, it's great work and I think it's advancing the city on every front. So I really love to uh, look at the kind of these quick wins that the general manager reviewed. I think some of these initiatives are very exciting and um, the fact that they've had to work with so many stakeholders, I mean the pressure and the demand on our, on our curb lanes uh, are, are unbelievable and she did a great job today in describing that demand and pressure and facilitating this is next to impossible. But I think some of these quick wins, like the pilot on allowing the taxi waiting areas at the fire hydrants is very interesting. Certainly had never heard of that before uh, this report came out. So I think these are some, there's some great um, guiding principles in this strategy and quick wins, as I said. And I'm uh, very pleased to see this before us today. So thank you again for another step in the right direction towards addressing gridlock and congestion. Um, on that note, I would move the, the um, recommendations and the staff report. So all those in favor? 
Opposed? That carries. Okay, and I think we're on to our last item, if I'm not... You're correct. Okay, I am correct. So, PW 25.13, we have a few speakers on this item, and the first speaker is Jared. Um, come on up. Okay, let's move on then to Jason Timmermanis. You're next. Come on, welcome. So, you just turn on the mic in front of you, and... Um, You can start. Well, at some point we will. I, I think some of the speakers have. Okay, if you could if you could start, that would be wonderful. Welcome. Hello, everybody. Um, so my name is Jason Timmermanis, and I'm a resident of Little Italy, and I wanted to share my experience with being doored in Little Italy, as I think um, the results of that illustrate the record that we need to implement the recommendations from the Board of Health. So just some background, um, and hopefully I'll get a picture going of my injury. I know it was um, dis uh, distributed last night, I believe. Um, so on the evening of November 5th, 2016, I was biking home along College Street. And of course, it was nighttime and I had my lights flashing, as a, every cyclist should. And um, the traffic was at a standstill as I reached the part of college where the bike lane runs out near um, the Royal Theater. So I was forced into traffic and I was riding in the narrow lane running between the cars in traffic and the row of parked cars. So parked cars on my right and cars in traffic on my left. So I was going through and uh, an Uber decided to let out their passengers um, just in the middle of the road with no, no indication that they were doing so. So the door opened, it um, stabbed into my leg and threw me off my bike and I smashed into a parked car. So, um, so, the, um, so I was laying in the street and then um, the staff members from the Royal Theatre had seen and, and they came out to check on me. Uh, the Uber drove away, they didn't stop, they didn't check how I was. The, the passenger who did get out of the Uber um, and who had hit me blamed the Uber. Um, I was able to get the contact information and the name of the person who got out and hit me with the door. Um, Subsequently, the staff members from the theater mentioned that this person would be charged under during the Doring legislation. Uh, he then ran away. <laughs> so, um, there, yeah, there we go, it's up on the screen. So, uh, I was left in the road with um, Uber gone, the uh, person who hit me left, and then uh, the theater had called the police on my behalf, and the police had said that they don't need to attend for a Doring. So uh, I limped home and um, my legs swelled up and I couldn't move for three days, so I was on the couch. Um, so after that, um, I filed a police report the next day. I provided the name of the man who hit me, his workplace even, his contact number, um, and all the information for the Uber car. Um, so now we're talking 12 months later, um, nothing happened with the police. So. I followed up about eight times with the police, trying to see what, whether they were collecting statements from my witnesses that I provided. And every time I contacted them, they were like, oh, we'll, we'll look into it, we'll, we'll look into it. So the final answer I got um, just a couple weeks ago was that uh, they never got around to doing it, and now it's too late to press any charges on anyone. Um, so in terms of the proposals before you, so if Dorings were considered part of the formal collision reporting process, I think the police might have actually taken my accident seriously instead of treating it as something that they couldn't be bothered with. Um, as my experience shows, the increased penalties for Dorings are meaningless when faced with an apathetic police force. In turn, if Dorings were taken seriously by the police, then the man who hit me would have thought twice before running away. As it is, he thought he could get a he could get run away and get away with it, and he was right. So he did get away with it, despite the police having his name and contact information and witnesses from day one. If the Uber driver had been trained to look for cyclists, indicate, and then pull over before releasing passengers, he wouldn't have let his passengers open their door in the middle of traffic and hit me. If he had also been found partially responsible for my accident, he would likely now be off offloading passengers more carefully. Instead, he left the scene of the accident, and today he's probably already forgotten he ever hit me. 
I never found out his name because Uber would only release it to the police, and then the police didn't deem it important enough to gather the information from Uber. So in Uber's defense, they did compensate me for my lost work time and medical expenses. Finally, if the passengers had been taught something as simple as the Dutch reach, they would have looked behind them and seen the flashing lights of my helmet, and I wouldn't have a permanent four-inch scar on my leg today. So I encourage you to adopt the recommendations of the Board of Health for the safety of all the city's cyclists. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you for your presentation. Uh, next is Hamish. Uh, quite a story and uh, uh, sometimes when you get a crash like that or some harm, uh, yes there's the immediate uh, harm, uh, but sometimes it, uh, it takes 24 hours or it uh, can manifest for a longer time too. You know, things, uh, things just don't go away overnight and we don't bounce as uh, readily as some of us used to. Uh, so uh, this is a really serious set of issues. Uh, I'm glad that the Board of Health is waking up to it. Uh, it is especially pronounced in the narrow, tight roads of the old core. Uh, that's like King, Queen, Dundas, College, but some of College, not all of it, because it's wider with bike lanes. Uh, less so Harvard, still on Harvard and Wellesley. Uh, less so now uh, with, uh, with the bike lanes, the separated bike lanes on Wellesley for sure, and Bloor, of course. Again, some partial improvement. Uh, uh, but uh, you can see on this picture, uh, pre-bike lane bluer, uh, when you have a, a gentleman opening, uh, opening up the door, there's the lane line. That's about the comfort zone there to there, kind of, is where cyclists like to ride and where we can ride uh, somewhat safely. On the streets that have the streetcar tracks, however, there's another huge set of issues in that uh, the streetcar tracks present a real set of dangers. And oh, hey, some new information in case you haven't seen this before. Uh, when you actually start mapping where we're uh, uh, harmed, and this does include some doorings, no doubt about it, does include the streetcar track crashes. So that's a whole set of issues. I think we were going to have a set of uh, data collected on the harms to uh, cyclists from streetcar track crashes. I'm not sure if that's been done yet, speaking of data. Uh, but you can see that there's a consistent set of harm and crash along the, uh, the main roads that are tight. And so it's really important to be acting on this. And there's a further set of actions that you could actually take with this, which is to ask the police to start enforcing the, uh, or the Green P, I'm not sure who does it, uh, the uh, issuing of tickets uh, to uh, cars that are parked too far out. So here is an example of what happens uh, on Bloor Street before uh, bike lanes uh, went in there. Uh, a car was parked too far out, a cyclist passes. In order to pass a cyclist, you got across the yellow line. So to some extent, the vehicles are, uh, when they're too parked too far out from the curb, there's a set of issues. Uh, and of course, oh my goodness, who would that have been that actually parked too far out? This was just, you know, in a rush, I guess, who knows whom. Uh, was doing it, and this is passed, so of course, you know, hey, and nobody hurt, as far as I know, but you've got to make sure that the police start enforcing the, or the Greenpeace start enforcing the bylaws to get people parked uh, tightly to the curb. Uh, so please add a motion or something, and if you had a, uh, someone from the uh, core of the city on the committee, like the old core, with respect to uh, the, 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 the two uh, women on the committee who are still within the boundaries of uh, the old city, we really needed somebody from south of Eglinton, basically, or south of St. Clair on this committee. Uh, with respect to y'all, uh, it's really been uh, a biased committee, I think. Uh, that's absolutely not appropriate. Um, I think it to totally is. No, I, it's not appropriate. And would you apologize to the committee, please? I won't, because quite honestly, I don't think that uh, you're excuse representing... Excuse me. It, no. I would like you to stay on topic, which you haven't consistently today. I don't And I've asked so. you to apologize to the committee. You can't call a committee biased with no rationale or reasoning. My rationale is that everybody south, there's no, rep, no council representative south of, That's what is it, Eglinton? That's not before us. You have to stay on topic. That's in Robert's Rules of Order. And I spoke well, to you about this at our last meeting. Please speak to the issue. 
Well, my, my, I have been trying to improve the cycling safety for decades in the old core since it takes so long to get very scant done. Even though there's been large change in the last few years, thank you very much. It's been very good change in some ways, but we are lacking the continuity for the, uh, for the bike safety on the easiest parts. When you have the uh, uh, streetcar tracks that are a real problem, to try and address the uh, the bike safety, because you can't just rearrange the bike lanes as say on Bloor Street. Uh, it really is incredibly important to have the safety and enforcement of uh, having the cars parked tight. We have a question for you. Uh, am I, oh my goodness, time scuds. I, I'm sorry that I didn't mention the Uber Lyft stuff, uh, because that's a whole set of Really Thank you. With, you with there's insurance. a question for you. Yes. Any questions? Would you uh, elaborate on what you mean by a biased committee? Yes, sir. Uh, it would be really helpful if you all had some experience with cycling in the core. Ah. That would really, really help. Am Even I unqualified as a committee member? Pardon me, sir? Am I unqualified as a committee member? Uh, I don't know what I'm, I'm doing here. No, it was really pleasant to see you actually open the, uh, do, it really helped. Great. Am I unqualified as a committee member? You said it was, it was a biased committee. Should I be here? Well, if we had more, uh, I don't know how everybody gets around, but there's, a, there's carism, sir, uh, which is a discrimination by motor Carism. Car carism. Car servitism. Fantastic. Uh, p pardon me? So, I, so, because I drive a car, I don't know what I'm doing? No, sir. I'm un but am I unqualified to be there here? There is a car servitism in Toronto, and there is a corruption in Toronto. corruption. Yeah, corruption. These are not new terms. They go back decades, sir. Would it help if I was a pedestrian for 25 years in the downtown Absolutely. Port, almost every day? Absolutely. It'd be Does that a, qualify me? That's a big help. Absolutely. Thank goodness. Yeah, but it's, it's the biking experience. You don't have cyclists that have that experience as a counselor biking around in the center core of the city. So you know, I, all should try it. Uh, because so quite we honestly, should be I think something that would yeah, really help is to have removal of driving uh, privileges. Uh, yeah, I think that's really not fair. Fair. Um, well, to be fair, we all I cycle and we have... all walk and we well, all use cycle in the city. and we all drive. Come on, cycle oh. in the city, please. Thank you very much for your contributions. Uh, we're going to move on and um, to our next speaker, which is Chris Glover. Jared is here now. Can we speak? Sure, that's fine. Yep, if you want to come along, that's great. Thanks, Chair Robinson uh, and members of the committee. Uh, good afternoon um, and uh, uh, happy, uh, happy late November. Um, of course, my name is Jared Kolb and I'm Executive Director of Cycle Toronto here before you to talk about the report at hand related to during collisions in the City of Toronto. Um, I, I want to characterize this uh, first by saying that uh, a Doring collision is, as many of you know, one of the most common uh, collision types for a cyclist in the city. Uh, it is one that can have life-changing impacts, uh, and it's also one that is difficult to solve. Uh, I want to, you know, really present that up front, and it will take a multifaceted solution uh, to solve Doring in the city. Uh, in, on one part it's infrastructure, on another it's education, on another it relates to enforcement. Uh, and the report that is before you today uh, and the re relevant motions I think help us get us towards uh, a solution. Um, I'll say that, you know, based on the analysis that we did earlier in the year of the Toronto Police Services, uh, numbers of during collisions, uh, they're on the rise. Uh, so between 2014 and 2016, we saw an increase of 58% uh, of the total number of Dorings as reported to the Toronto Police. So there were at least uh, 206, I believe was the number, reported in t t uh, 2016. Um, so, uh, I think that's an important note. Um, we know the most dangerous types of streets for Dorings uh, on the heat map uh, that uh, is, uh, we, we put together relates to streets with on-street parking um, and streetcar tracks being the most uh, notoriously dangerous uh, from a Doring perspective. Um, on streets where there are painted bike lanes, Doring rates come down. On streets with protected bike lanes, they're near zero. 
Uh, so there certainly is an infrastructure component to this. Uh, Richmond and Adelaide, I think, is a good example of a street that previously had a higher number of dooring uh, collisions and that has really come down after the installation of the protected bike lanes there. Um, there are some specific things that we can do, um, and I will say that it is, I think for people that ride a bike in the city of Toronto, it is nonsensical uh, to imagine that a dooring collision is tracked as an incident uh, to, by the Toronto police rather than uh, by a, as a collision. Um, and that, that was a change, of course, made at the provincial level. It will require the provincial uh, level to change it again uh, and to include Dorings as a collision in their motor vehicle accident report. So I think that's one opportunity here uh, for Public Works and for Toronto City Council uh, to make a clear statement that says, you know, we, we really do want to tackle this problem and we need to see the province take action to change uh, how we go about reporting these collisions. Because I think as, as the previous depu deputant really underscored, um, the fact that this is uh, effectively demoted to an incident report means that the Toronto Police don't take it uh, with the level of gravity and seriousness that it deserves. Um, it is a $365 fine uh, when you know you door a person riding a bike in the city of Toronto and across the province. A lot of police members actually just don't know that. Uh, and a part of that problem is, is that collision type doesn't actually appear on their reporting sheets. Um, so I think that's one area that we can improve. I think the other is that we've effectively unleashed uh, a, a huge number of untrained uh, drivers onto uh, Toronto streets in our uh, you know, policy around vehicle for hire uh, service. And I was doored in 2015 um, by a passenger getting out of, an, out of an Uber vehicle. I know a lot of people who have been, uh, and I think this is a real challenge in that previously we had a regime uh, that set out mandatory uh, training uh, for taxi drivers in the city. We've lost that, and I think that is something that deserves further consideration uh, for all vehicle for hire drivers. Um, I think a, a deputy to come is going to talk about the Dutch Reach as well as a really easy educational tool um, for all drivers um, in terms of using your right hand to open your driver door. If you're a pedestrian though, it means using your left to force a shoulder check. Uh, and I'll just also say to cyclists, really important to not be riding in the door zone uh, and that that's a, that's a really important piece as well uh, to be able to avoid that collision. So overall, I'd say that there's, there's a lot we can do. Um, I chatted with staff and with Council Robinson previously uh, and that uh, Doring's and, and Doring analysis will be included uh, going forward in the Vision Zero report uh, and we'll see further solutions there and which we're excited about. So I'll, I'll leave my comments there. Uh, thanks for your time. Okay, thank you. Any questions? I have a quick one. Um, I was really happy to hear you say multifaceted because it is indeed that. That's a really good way to describe it. And would you, would you agree that um, I'll call it Toronto's ground transportation industry, i.e. taxis, Uber, are a big piece of this uh, puzzle. I think so. Yeah, yeah so I would you, agree with you. you would probably concur that we need to make sure they're engaged? I think so, yeah. I, we know that uh, Uber, for instance, as one example, is sending out push notifications to their drivers about watching for cyclists. Um, I, you know, I, with respect to Uber, I, we're all bombarded with push notifications on our phones repeatedly. I don't, I don't think that's nearly good enough. Uh, and I think we do need uh, a, uh, a training regime um, that all drivers, because I think it's, it's important to note that if you're a driver you know, of, a, of an Uber vehicle or of a taxi, um, your incentive is to uh, pick up, uh, t you know, transport your passenger and drop them off as quickly as possible. Uh, and so for my experience with personally with being doored, I was actually doored in a bike lane and it was because a driver just swooped in in front of me uh, and the passenger jumped out. So I think that there's a, an important training component to this uh, that currently I think the, the policy environment lacks. Okay, so we'll call them, we'll call it Toronto's ground transportation industry. So okay. we, it's a catch-all. Yep. All right, that's good. Thank you for your presentation. We're going to move on. Uh, I do think we need a motion to extend. We do have three speakers left. Um, and I have a motion I want to move on this to move it. So we, Councillor Lee, uh, all in favour, and that we voted to extend. Okay, so our next speaker is Chris Glover, and then Hash, and then Christine. And then we're going to move into committee. I 
Yeah, that's impressive. <laughs> Props. Um, yes. Well, I think it's sort of a, a lighthearted way to make a, take, make a message. So first of all, I just want, so my name is Chris Glover and I'm a TDSB trustee and I'm also serve on the Board of Health and as the TDSB trustee, I'd like to uh, thank all of you for your advocacy around uh, school soul and safety when you were talking about the Vision Zero. I think this is a, uh, an issue where we are completely allied and where we can, you know, work together between the city council and the, and the schools. and. Um, and I think the, the importance that is really brought forward by uh, what Councillor Peruzza, the accident that he was mentioning, it was actually Violet Liang uh, who was killed on the first day of school and it was in 2013 and she was 14 years old. So I think it, that just uh, reinforces the importance of that discussion that you were having. Um, let's see, so I'm here today because I was doored in the spring and it brought to me, it raised my awareness of just how common this kind of accident is. And I'll show you, I'm gonna start with the, uh, the pictures. And so I've been asking people who've been doored to send me pictures of their injuries. And so these are some of the injuries. Uh, one of them you've already seen, but this is a person who had her wrist broken and she's actually a massage therapist and she had to, lost a lot of time off work, but she had to get a, an open surgery on her wrist. Um, this is Jason that you just saw, his thigh. Uh, this is another person who was doored and the bruise on her thigh. Uh, that's actually my arm. And, um, and when, I was when I was injured, it was my left arm, my left leg, my right knee was swollen. And this is another person who also uh, was doored. So it's a, it is a really important issue, um, this doorings. And I'll tell you uh, what happened to me. So I was riding my bike along Bloor Street and uh, just past where the bike lanes ended and an Uber uh, went past me. She stopped three feet out from the curb to let her passenger out. He opens the back door. I had no idea that somebody was gonna get out. So I got it on the, on the left side. My, I was thrown off my bike. My front wheel was twisted and I'm limping around. I'm in pain and I said to the driver, I need your license and insurance. And she says, I don't have to give it to you. And I said, no, no, we just had an accident. You, we have to share information. And she says, no, this has nothing to do with me. It's the passenger. And I said, no, <laughs> you know, we're supposed to go to a collision reporting center and everything. Um, the police came and when the police came, they said, in a way she's right. Uh, uh, Doorings have been downgraded from accidents to incidents in 2011, as, as Jared just mentioned in the previous deputation. And this means that they're not tracked in the same way as accidents. Uh, the people involved, cyclists involved, don't have the same uh, legal uh, rights that they would otherwise. And it actually creates a lot of confusion uh, for the police and how they report it. And I'll give you a quote from another, uh, from one of the written deputations. This person was doored and she said, when I called the police to report, the first officer wasn't sure if this could be reported over the phone. The second officer that called me back to, to take my report said it wasn't really reportable since it wasn't the driver that doored me. He said he could note this, but nothing further. Then the third officer, an investigator, called and said it was reportable and the passenger could be fined. So there's real confusion in the police service over what an incident actually means. And so part of the motion is actually to re-upgrade doorings to accidents so that they're classified as, as other collisions and the, and the uh, steps that the police would take are, are very clear. Um, let's see, I have, so I've shown you the accidents, uh, the numbers. Jared Kolb mentioned the numbers. 
In 2014, there were 132 Dorings. Last year, there were 209. There are, so far this year, 171. So the number of Dorings is growing rapidly. We don't know whether it's because there's more cyclists. I suspect that it may be because there's more Ubers and other vehicle for hire out there. A lot of, it's only anecdotal reporting, but people have been writing to me about their Doring incidents, and many of them do involve Ubers or, or vehicle for hire. So it seems that the training that they receive is an inadequate, and that's another uh, part of the motion. So I have uh, two requests for you. The first one is, in receiving information from other people who've endured, I realize that there's a need for greater information. And so I've asked uh, for an amendment to the motion as it stands, which is for the city to collect information about doorings. And there's a number of categories of the, of the information. It would include the location, whether it was a passenger or driver, which door it was that, that was involved, uh, whether anybody was charged. So I'd ask, uh, and Councillor Perusa has taken that, uh, that amendment, and I'm hoping that you will bring it forward and support it. And my other request, is, uh, has to do with something that many city councillors have already done. And we have Councillor Cressy, Mahevich, Fragedakis, Doucette, Councillor Holiday did it this morning, and you may have seen Councillor Peruzza just did it, and it's called the Dutch Reach. Okay? And the Dutch Reach is a way of opening a door that everybody who's uh, in Holland is trained. So when you're doing your driver training in Holland, they teach you to open the door with the opposite hand. So if you're driving, you open the door with your right hand, you turn in your seat, you do a shoulder check to make sure there's no cyclists coming. So I, my second request is I have a door here, and I'd request that the councillors who haven't done it yet uh, please come and, and get a video of, of you doing the Dutch Reach. And we've been tweeting it out, and I think it's working sort of as a, as a public health message. That this is, the Dutch Reach is a safety measure that all of us can take to make our roads a little bit safer. Okay. Thank you. Okay, do we have any questions for our deputant? Thank you very much. Okay. And for your prop. Okay, go ahead. We're trying to get some clarity. Uh, so in collecting the data, who would you, uh, in your view, who would be best positioned to collect that, that additional data? Because there seems to be some, some confusion about who here might be in, in the best position to do that. I think it would be the, my, my think it would be, be the police service because they're often called to these during incidents and so they are there. And the one who was at mine, he wrote, a, he, he wrote what was, his, was titled at the top an accident report, but he said this isn't really an accident report. He didn't actually have a proper form to fill out an incident report. So there is reporting being done, uh, just if it would be a little bit more specific and if it would be clearer for the police so they know how to respond. So we'd be asking the police uh, when they fill out, w w now when they do their incidents reports that they would, that they would uh, you know, transmit that, that information to someone somewhere, some yeah. data bank. Right, right, and that, that would be publicly available. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think because information can allow us to understand the extent and the causes of the problem and then address it better. Our next speaker is Hash. I don't know if he's still here or not. Or, no, okay, so Christine, you're up. And that's our last speaker. And then we're gonna move into committee. Welcome, Christine. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, I, th I think there have been a lot of really interesting items brought up here today, uh, and I love the phrase, looking at things through the uh, vision zero lens. I think that's a really good one. And this idea that, you know, this, these pictures, these horrible stories of Doring, it's something that's been an issue in our city for a long time. We're hearing that it's worse now than ever. Um, in July of 2016, though, when the vision zero road safety plan was approved by council, that same meeting, the rules were enacted to allow Uber or to provide a level playing field or whatever the buzz phrase at the time was. But what it did it was effectively remove any training component to license a taxi driver, to license an Uber driver, while we proceeded to license 2,000 taxi drivers and 50,000 Uber drivers to cruise our city for fares. Um, that training came at no cost 
to the city. That was supported by the industry, paid for by the industry, and I think, um, obviously, I'm here to support the motion that's been put forward. Um, you know, training is what prevents these accidents. Training is what uh, what we need in this case, this is a safety issue. Uh, you know, I, I respect that Uber had paid his time off for this uh, victim behind me, but the reality is push notifications, as Jared said, are just not enough. And paying people for their time off work and paying them for their medical bills doesn't prevent this from continuing to happen. And luckily, this gentleman behind me only had those extent of injuries. I mean, obviously, it can be a devastating thing. Um, the moment that training was removed from the vehicle for hire industry, the moment that was enacted, hundreds of people lined up outside of the 850 Coxwell Licensing and Standards Office. Hundreds of people. The main reason for that is that there was no training required. And they wanted to be able to drive cars in this city without having to invest anything. They want to drive for money and use our city roads to do it but not to have any training. At that point, obviously, uh, from Beck Taxi, our concern was we won't work in this environment. We partnered with Centennial College. 600 Beck Taxi drivers have gone through this course, newly licensed drivers who didn't receive the previous training. It includes an in-car defensive driving component for the first time that wasn't even offered through the city course. We've condensed it to a one-week course. It includes all of you know, your at least even basic AODA training, that was taken off uh, the board as well, which I'm not even sure is legal. <laughs> but um, the reality is training is necessary. Um, we've been able to make it work. Whether it was taken back by the city, that's something else. It was, it was not at any cost. The taxi industry has never appeared on the taxpayer's bill. So this is something we need to remember. Push notifications, messages, we're doing that. But what we also do, is have very, very clearly marked vehicles. This helps for reporting. This allows us to actually connect with drivers, not through an app. We talk to them. We're educating them. This is what allows us to say that we are a responsible corporate partner. Uber has none of these things. They're talking about sending the push notifications. It's just not enough. And so I would support as well those small mirrors on the sides of a lot of taxis that you see. They're fantastic. Paired with the Dutch Reach, which is an, also an amazing uh, initiative, you know, the stickers that are inside of the windows of taxis that are not inside the windows of Uber vehicles. I mean, if this was supposed to be, you know, if they were, all things were meant to be created equal, and I'm not even talking about the playing field, how is it that we are allowing some vehicles for hire to not have to have even the basic stickers that taxis are required to have by the same city? So I would just say again, um, you know, there's a huge conflict of interest in a lot of the things we've talked about tonight, uh, today when it comes to the number of vehicles that have been licensed for Uber cars, 50,000 of them. I don't think it lends itself to congestion management. I don't think it lends itself to curbside management. I don't think it lends itself to um, safety in school zones. And I think, you know, this is a piece that has been completely ignored through all of our discussions when it comes to road safety, vision zero. And, you know, I don't know where Chris is today. He was going to give us a presentation, but he's not here. Um, these are conversations that are important and people should show up for them. And that's okay. it. Okay, thank you very much. Right on time. Any questions for Christine? None, seeing none? Uh, yeah, I just okay, one go quick ahead. Question. Well, um, again, we immediately contacted Centennial College. Uh, they have a certification course. It's called Taxi 101. It could be called Vehicle for Hire 101. It's one week. It includes an in-car defensive training course, uh, driving course. Um, you know, training is out there. It's available. I don't still know why the city removed that from its uh, responsibility. I, I'm still very, very confused by it. But, um, you know, we found that it was important and we're the only company requiring it. I'm not sure how that's possible, but it's important. And I think that any driver who wants to make money in this city, driving people around, and as we've heard, it's the in and out of the bike lanes, it's opening the doors. These people are not aware of their own responsibilities when it comes to providing that service. Training is, I, I don't know how you could not <laughs> support this motion. 
It's so easy. It comes at no cost to the city. It provides a safer environment for cyclists and for pedestrians and passengers and drivers even. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of a no-brainer as, as, as far as I can see. And again, comes at no cost to the city. So I just don't. It's costing the city not to require it. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you, Christine. Uh, that's so the end of our speakers list. We're moving now to questions of staff. Any questions of staff? Councillor Holliday has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I uh, appreciated the trustee bringing the door in, and it was uh, it was a fun experience to go and try it. So you have the chance. Um, but I wondered uh, if staff were aware of the the Dutch Reach and. Um, it's something you've been thinking about. Through you, uh, yes, we are. We, um, we follow sort of uh, information about uh, cycling safety quite closely, and uh, it's certainly something that's come up in a number of um, more international publications, but also here as well. Uh, we've been certainly uh, paying attention to it, and how that information gets out, I think, is, is kind of an important um, an important component of this, so just reading it in uh, versus being trained in it. I don't, I'm not currently aware of a lot of uh, opportunities that we have uh, to train people. So, uh, I, I mean, I try this, it seems like one of those sort of common sense things, you know, you use your opposite hand to make you turn, and I, I would say that the Dutch Reach is probably important beyond even scenarios of bicycles operating near cars. I mean, I, I'm gonna go talk to my kids about it when I get home, um, you know, just in a parking lot. You know, there could be people walking by, and it just it just seems like a, a safer way to do things. And I'm surprised I don't I don't remember it being talked about in in driving school a long long time ago. But do we do information campaigns in the city, and is there any opportunity to include something simple like this in there? Through you, uh, we do, and uh, as part of Vision Zero, we're looking at mounting a couple of campaigns next year. And so uh, I think it would be a good idea for us to try to incorporate some of that information. So you could you could slip a message in there easy enough that that reminds drivers or tells them to go figure out what this is and use it all the time. Not just I, I would encourage you not to do it during a bicycles or just around bicycles, but just use it all the time. I think that way people get ingrained. Is that something that could be done? Yes, and I think we'd want to um, we'd want to uh, couple that with um, looking at some of the infrastructure that's recently been put out there for cycling in the city, just to make sure people are aware of what it is and how to use it. And I think this would uh, be well incorporated into that kind of an education campaign. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Councillor Lee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good question. Although it's not considered, uh, Doring is not uh, formally collision reporting, but we do get reports on it, uh, how many Dorings occur. Do we get that uh, report from the police? Through you, yes, we do. Okay, so we should be able to strike that. Thank you. Okay. No other questions? Okay, then I've got a motion if the clerks can put it on the, um, on the screen. Uh, this is uh, a clearly an important issue, and I thank all the deputants for coming out today um, because it was very insightful, and including the props, um, very interesting. So as I think Jared uh, described, this is a multifaceted issue. And the more I delve into it and, and, and talk to uh, various senior officials at City Hall, I, what I learned was there's already a, a lot of uh, initiatives and, and directives that have been um, really directed to the transportation um, industry, the ground transportation industry. And so I, my understanding is, is that the executive director of MLS has been directed to report back uh, in 2018 on all these outstanding council directives regarding the Toronto's ground transportation industry. And I think we need to consider all of this in, in a comprehensive way because it is, it is very multi-leveled and tiered. And so that's why I'm proposing this motion is that uh, we direct the, the executive director of municipal licensing and standards for a report back and uh, on these issues that we, we have before us today and all the outstanding directives as one comprehensive plan. And uh, that will really give us a council a way forward on this. So that's my motion. Um, it, it's something that's near and dear to my heart, this issue. It's uh, very important that we 
Um, really look at all these options. We had 171 doorings so far this year, unacceptable. We have to make sure there's training in place. Councillor Holliday's, um, you know, very, I think, very, feeling very strongly about the, this Dutch reach concept, which I've heard about before, and it sounds like a great, um, great initiative to embed into some of our uh, education programs related to Vision Zero. So I definitely, definitely support that and looking at um, new requirements and all possible options to reduce this, this number that uh, is trending in the right, wrong direction. Although 2016 was higher, uh, but we're not through the entire year yet. We still have a five weeks to go. So uh, we wanna see this number come down dramatically. It's unsettling for cyclists. It, it's it's unsettling, unsettling for everybody involved because it's, uh, it's very, um, I know this is, I know family members have had near misses with this and it's very disturbing when this kind of thing happens for all parties, but um, certainly the, the cyclists being doored, it's just like shocking, it happens out of nowhere and so that's why we need to address this. So uh, I hope you'll support uh, this motion in moving this forward to, through the system and looking at this in a comprehensive manner. Other speakers on this item? Yeah. Uh, question of the... Uh, yeah, sure, go ahead. Uh, the recommendation has two parts. The first part is for City Council to write to the Premier. And uh, I can see the second part being referred, but the first part, are we going to move that to Council? Um, the, in my conversations with, with staff, um, they felt the whole thing should be bundled and sent to to MLS because of the complexities and, and the directives they, are, they already have. For, they have a number of directives from us, from right. Council, and so uh, really packaging in with the rest of those directives and reporting back in one comprehensive report in the new year. But that doesn't stop uh, individual city councillors from uh, writing their own letters. Okay, thank Absolutely, you. that's correct. Uh, next, uh, other speakers? <coughs> Councillor Peruzza. Um, yeah, Madam Chair, I, I, I'd like to take carriage for uh, Trustee Glover's um, a request for an amendment. It's relatively reasonable. It's just really um, sort of keeping track of some of the uh, uh, incidences and some of the information that uh, um, I believe is already being collected. Um, so um, uh, I'd like to uh, move that on his behalf. Uh, and, and just simply say, uh, really in response to... Uh, um, uh, to a comment that was made earlier by, by a deputy. And, uh, uh, I, I'm an avid cyclist. I, I ride my bike uh, often. I ride my bike often downtown. And uh, I've always been relatively lucky. I've never um, been doored per se. That's not to say that I haven't crashed on my bike. Uh, I have on, on several occasions uh, 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 crashed. And uh, on one of them particularly, I wouldn't be able to show you any pictures because they would just simply be too saucy to to uh, to put up on the on the screen in terms of where uh, where um, I was injured. So, um, but uh, I just simply uh, I say that in, to, in in response to, to to one of the deputants. But it is a, a scary it's a scary event when you're cycling, uh, especially downtown. Uh, you're you're you know, this notion that someone could jump out in front of you or a car come across an intersection or pull out of a driveway, uh, you're, you're constantly uh, uh, sort of on the lookout for that. Uh, but you're also constantly on the lookout to see uh, if there, there's anybody in the cars that are either parked or, or pulling up on, on the road because you know that that's, that's an incident waiting to happen. It's just, it's just an alarm that goes off in, 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 I think in every cyclist's brain to, to sort of you know, um, uh, be on the lookout for that. And, uh, and, uh, and I think that that's, that's something that could happen to anybody at any time. And, and it should be, uh, it should be uh, treated and, uh, and taken seriously because it's, uh, uh, it's, uh, it, it, you, can, you can hurt someone. Um, uh, uh, and uh, uh, just simply by, uh, you know, sort of being negligent and not be worried about, uh, um, you know, someone on a on a bicycle. It's uh, uh, it's really interesting, especially as as someone who uh, who not only likes to ride a bike, I also uh, ride a motorcycle. And just drivers in a two thousand pound car just simply don't take note of you. 
uh, when, when you're on a, on a lighter vehicle. They'll do like really weird stuff in front of you all the time. They'll just, you know, jump out onto a road, they see you coming, too bad, so sad. Because they know that uh, you, um, you're the person who's going to be put in a defensive position because you're going to lose that, uh, that, that um, uh, you know, that exchange. Uh, it's just it's just the way it is and and there's a lot of people who who are in big vehicles uh, who then who don't uh, uh, who aren't cognizant and who aren't uh, um, you know uh, uh, prepared to seed or to or, or to to pay heed to people on uh, on uh, on, uh, on lighter vehicles so um, uh, and I think uh, you know sort of opening your door without without uh, uh, you know, taking a look to see who's coming uh, is very much part of that. It's just, just some people do. They're not worried about it. I'm in my car. I open the door. Uh, oh, geez, too bad, so sad. You know, some guy flipped over the flipped over the door. Uh, we all uh, uh, have a tendency to sort of uh, uh, be that way a lot of the times, and it's uh, it's really regrettable. So we should treat be treating it more seriously. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, the motions, nobody else wanted to speak that I, you made your point on the Dutch reach in your questions, so that's good. Um, so this is the motion before us, uh, that the item be referred to the Executive Director of Municipal Licensing and Services for a report back as part of the update on all outstanding directives regarding Toronto's ground transportation industry. Um, uh, I will move that, obviously. It's my motion all in favour. Against, that carries. Okay, so that is... All right, so that carries, so our meeting has now concluded. Thank you very much, everyone, for a great meeting, and to all the staff and deputants for your insights and hard work. No, I'm not.